Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is December 14th, 2022, and the time is 9.30 a.m. Today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. There are a couple of ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. To call in, please dial 669-444-9171, and when prompted, enter the collaboration code number 814-8152-8029. And again, this information is posted on the Planning Department webpage. During key points in today's meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link or of calling in by telephone by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you are participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record, and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six. And I'll remind everybody of these instructions as we move forward. If at any time you're having difficulty connecting to today's meeting via the Zoom link or by calling in, we do have support with staff with us today. Um, Nick Brown, he's our new planning technician. You can email him at nicholas.brown at santacruzcounty.us. He'll be checking his email periodically throughout the meeting and he's um, ready to assist anyone who needs additional help. All right, and with those instructions, I will turn over the meeting to our Planning Commission Chair, Chair Tim Gordon. Good morning. Good morning, Jocelyn. Thank you for that intro and welcome everyone to today's uh, Santa Cruz County Planning Commission hearing. It is 934 and we can call this meeting to order. Ms. Drake, can we please start with a roll call? Uh, yes. Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Commissioner Shepard? Here. And Chair Gordon? Here. Okay. Great. Thank you. And moving right along, do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda today? Uh, no, not today. Wonderful. Okay. And agenda item number three, declaration of ex parte communications. Do you have any commissioners that would like to declare anything today? I, I did meet with uh, Deidre from Hamilton Planning on item number seven. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, great. And with that, we can close agenda number three and move on to number four, oral communications. This is the time when members of the public have the opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda today. And Ms. Drake, do we have anyone that would like to speak at this time? Um... Let's see, so this is the time again for folks who wish to provide comment on any subject matter not on today's agenda to please make yourself known by raising your hand by pressing the hand icon on the Zoom link or by pressing star nine on your telephone. You would have two minutes to speak. And Chair, I am not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Oh wait, one just popped up. Sure. All right, I am seeing a hand, a hand raised by Ali Webster. Good morning, please restate your name for the record. You have two minutes. Um, Ali, oh. Good morning. Let's see. Hi, I'm sorry. I don't believe I raised my hand. Um, I'm speaking on item number seven. Sorry about okay. that. Okay, no problem. We'll catch up with you in a bit. Thanks. Yep. I did see another hand raised by Tisa Murdoch. 
Um, good morning. Please state your name for the record. You have two minutes. Okay, I just got the unpop the unmute button. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. I was just um curious what um number three was that you met with Deirdre Hamilton on. I assume that's regarding the Jeffrey Beach access. I'm sorry, could you please state your name for the record? Teresa Murdoch. Teresa Murdoch, thank you. Uh does that conclude your comments? Yes. Okay, thank you. And let's see if we have any additional members of the public who wish to speak on anything that is not on the agenda today. I'm seeing no additional hands raised. I'll turn it back over to you, Chair. Great. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Lazenby, did you want to? clarify that that meeting was in regards to agenda item number seven. Oh, you're muted, Commissioner Lazenby. Yes, that was in regard to item number seven. Thank you. Okay, with that, we can close uh, agenda item number four, oral communications, and move on to item number five today, which is our consent agenda item, uh, AB 361 resolution. This might be our last one. It might, we have, we might have one more, but oh, okay. I, can, well, I can check in with the planning commission and later in the right. meeting. Great. Well, um, if there's any members of the commission that would like to make a motion on this item, it'd be appropriate. I'll move approval. Thank you, Commissioner Dan, thank you. Second. And second by Commissioner Violante. Thank you, Ms. Drake, can we please do a roll call vote on this? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Shepard? Commissioner Shepard? You're muted. Yes. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yes? Did, did you hear me that time? I did not. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Yes. yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. With that, the motion passes, and we can move on to agenda item number six, approval of the minutes of the November 9th Planning Commission hearing. And do any members of the commission have discussion or would like to make a motion on that? Um, great, thank you. And and I can second that. Um, so we have a motion and a second. Ms. Drake, can you please do a roll call vote on that? Okay. Commissioner Dan? Yes. Commissioner Violante? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? I abstain. Abstain. Okay. And uh, Chair Gordon? Yes. Great, thank you. That uh, motion passes and we can move on to the next agenda item. Agenda item number seven. This is a, a repair of a slump slide on 70 Jeffrey Drive, project application number 201302. Ms. Drake, do we have staff and uh, applicants available for this <coughs> item? Uh, yes, we have Nathan McBeth, um, Senior Planner with the Development Review Division with us today to present on this item. If we could load his PowerPoint, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, Melissa, do you have the PowerPoint? Um, I do. We'll okay. load it as backup. 
we were going to have you run it. Can you let me know which one? Is it 302 or 211? Um, it's 302. Thank you. And Nathan, you can just uh, let her know when to advance the slides. Great, thank you. <clears throat> uh, in the winter of 2019, 2020, uh, heavy rains caused a slope failure um, of a 10 foot high uh, section of the slope supporting a driveway access homes at, located at 60 and 70 Joffrey Drive. The failure was likely due to a clogged <clears throat> clogging of an existing drain inlet uh, near the top edge of the roadway. Uh, an emergency coastal development permit and grading permit application 201227 was issued for the construction of a slump slide repair by constructing a temporary reinforced slope and installing a 12 inch diameter drain pipe. All the work associated with the emergency repair was completed under the emergency coastal development permit and grading permits and uh, proper technical reports were prepared, submitted to the county for review and accepted. All work had been completed in accordance with the recommendations of those reports. <clears throat> County code requires a regular coastal development permit to be submitted following issuance of an emergency coastal development permit. The regular coastal development permit is intended to address any changes or long-term repairs uh, as opposed to the minimum repair necessary to prevent or mitigate the conditions posed by uh, posing imminent threat to life, health, property, essential public services. Uh, in this case, there are no changes uh, from the emergency coastal development permit uh, to the proposed regular coastal development permit. On October 21st, 2022, the zoning administrator, after a duly noticed hearing, uh, referred this application uh, 201302 to your commission for additional consideration. <clears throat> Some of the issues raised by the zoning administrator were regards to policies, uh, particularly policies pertaining to um, uh, shoreline access along Jeffrey Drive, where um, existing public access is located to 200 feet to the east of the project site. Um, <clears throat> and um, if you could uh, advance the slide, that would be great. So location of the project uh, at the end of Joffrey Drive. Next slide, please. The zoning for the site is uh, R16. Next slide, which is consistent with the general plan land use designation of urban low residential. Next slide, please. Again, the project site, a little bit closer look. It's sandwiched between Twin Lake Beach or Black's Beach and uh, Sunny Cove. Next slide, please. This is the location of the project on the slope immediately adjacent to the driveway, the end of Joffroy. Next slide, please. This slide represents the extent of the county maintained portions of Joffroy and 16th Avenue. The blue areas are existing developed beach access. And in this case, the access at the end of 16th Avenue is a uh, narrow trail that leads to a rock shelf. Next slide, please. These are photographs of the slope failure. <clears throat> As you can see in the lower left frame, the drain inlet um, where this gentleman's standing is what uh, was the cause of the failure. The upper frame is looking back at Black's Beach. Kind of the same with the lower right frame. Next slide, please. These are uh, plans for the project. It was uh, to grade approximately 50 cubic yards. They were going to key in uh, the fill slope, install a sub drain, install a 12 inch diameter drain pipe, stake to the slope with a new inlet, uh, install erosion control fabric for ridge vegetation and install a four foot high safety fence at the top of the slope. Next slide, please. 
uh, back one. Thank you. Uh, this is, these are photos of the completed work. <clears throat> the fabric overlaying the 12-inch uh, drain line, drain pipe staked to the slope. Um, kind of back up on top with the right and the frame to the right is the new drain inlet. Next slide, please. And a photo of the finished product with the <clears throat> four foot high safety fence. Next slide, please. This is a view looking back across Black's Beach at the project site. Um, some time had passed since this photo was taken in the previous frames. It shows the site starting to revegetate. Next slide, please. Oh, that's me. Um, staff has reviewed all the applicable policies cited by the general by, by the zoning administrator and continues to support a determination that the proposed slum slide repair and restoration of the project site is uh, to its pre-existing pre condition does not rise to the level of requiring further analysis and as to whether the public access over the subject property uh, further the scope of work does not uh, include or <clears throat> include or require the establishment of construction of uh, coastal access improvements. Um, correspondence was received from coastal staff, the applicant's representative, uh, members of the public and all comments and late correspondence are contained in your packet. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge last minute correspondence from uh, Bill Parkin, uh, Mike Guth and Elijah Mowbray. You should all have um, been forwarded those, cor those correspondence. Um, the primary concerns raised in those, in those letters were um, similar to what coastal staff has um, raised in the past regarding uh, uh, violations for placement of structures impeding public access, um, assertions regarding historic public access at the project site, and some concerns regarding the use of the CEQA exemptions contained in the packet. <clears throat> um, as proposed and conditioned, the project is uh, consistent with all applicable codes and policies of the zoning ordinance and general plan and therefore staff uh, recommends a determination that the proposal is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and approval of application 201-302 uh, based on the uh, <clears throat> findings and conditions. Uh, that, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Macbeth, appreciate that. Um, and the picture is really helpful. Thank you for that presentation. So at this time we can bring it back to the commission to to ask any questions that you might have of staff. Do any commissioners have anything they'd like to discuss? Commissioner Lazenby? I do have one question. Between the parking lot inlet and the um, cyclone fencing, I noticed three, at least three sprinkler risers that were right up next to the fence between the asphalt berm and the fencing. Is that system connected and why would it be there? Good question. Um, I guess, could, could you clarify maybe by one of the slides, the location of the, of the, um, of the uh, sprinklers you, you noticed? You could go back to the very first slide, I think. Oh, this one here, maybe? No, the, the oh. next one where the oh. individuals are standing. Oh, that would be a, here we are, yeah. Okay, you see where the inlet is in the parking lot, mm -hmm. and you see where the cyclone fencing is. Uh, go back to that that prior slide. I think it'd be to advance one more slide. Uh, that, there we go. This is the this is the completed work. Um, does this help? Okay, where the individuals are standing, just inside the asphalt berm or the curb. Okay, here we go. This is the slide. Just beyond that curb and between the curb 
and the fencing. I noted at least three 12 foot, 12 inch high sprinkler risers. And my question is, are those connected? Are those using, are, are they using that? And why would they be sprinkling that area? Yeah, you raise a good question. I don't see any risers in the in these photos. Um, you know, perhaps the applicant can clarify uh, whether or not this uh, irrigation system is functioning. Um, is that something that we can bring back, Commissioner Lazenby, when the applicant has their time to present and ask Certainly. the question of them? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. I have none at this time. I, I'm happy to hear from the public. Wait, I, I had a question. <laughs> Commissioner Shepard, please go ahead. So exactly what are we voting about determining the project <clears throat> exempt from further environmental review it's already been built right this exists so we are just this is a bureaucratic action to say that there's no review i'm, I'm not quite sure what we are doing here <clears throat> um that's a good question um our code requires that any emergency coastal development permit uh, that's issued by the county uh, come back with a regular coastal development permit. Uh, often cases that results in a subsequent <laughs> public hearing. The intent is to address any uh, permit conditions, site constraints that might now be present or changes to the project uh, from the time that the emergency work is performed and kind of looking at more of a long-term maintenance of um, whatever that hazard was. Um, in this case, uh, there is no change from what was done as the emergency repair and what is proposed as part of the um, long-term solution to that slope failure. So there's, normally you might have done an emergency Band-Aid and then have a plan for a more permanent solution. In this case, that's not the case. What we see is what we have and what we're going to get. So basically, this is just to dot any, uh, I don't, I still don't see what you want us to do here because you already did it. Right, right. I guess I would imagine kind of a two-part process with any emergency repair. Maybe it's just fill a hole with rock and then the, maybe the follow-up would be to, to pull the rock out and then to, you know, do maybe a, 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 a a unified seawall or something like that. In this case, as you mentioned, this is the, the long-term repair um, and, and yeah, an action uh, to um, acknowledge that work is, is required by county code. Well, what are the, uh, maybe if you step away from it, what are the issues here? It's all, it's already built. So like it says that we are going to determine the project exempt from further environmental review. Yeah. I, what other environmental review is there to be done when it's done? So. Um, yeah. I, Mr. Johnson yeah. has his hand. Perhaps he could answer the question. So uh, I, I came late into the CEQA determination, but I've done a, um, a detailed review of the history. The, um, the work was done under an emergency coastal development permit. Um, at that time, we determined that the, the work being done under the emergency coastal permit was exempt under the emergency uh, exemption under uh, statutory exemption under CEQA. Um, unfortunately, that's what should have been attached to this document. Um, the work done initially has already been done, as you recognize, it was done under a CEQA exemption. It was not a formally posted one. Statute of limitations on that was a six month running of statute of limitations, but uh, that which is long past. Um, so what I would recommend is if you decide to move forward with this, 
we revised the exemption to reflect the determination made with the ex uh, emergency coastal development permit that it was exempt under the emergency statute of CEQA. Well, in fact, if there has been a, if there was an emergency exemption already uh, made, then we probably don't need to make CEQA findings again. Doesn't that make sense, Matt? Um, I I would still because you're you're recognizing it as a permit, it, it is a discretionary action. Um, you should refer to a CEQA determination on a discretionary action, um, and the the appropriate one in this case. Again, it was not formally posted at the clerk of the board, which is not required under CEQA. Um, CEQA requires only the posting to shorten the uh, appeal period from six months to 30 days. Um, but if it's not posted, we have to, we can provide the environmental record that shows that we determined this project was an emergency project. Um, so that would be the exemption that we move forward on back then. As stated, there is no further work to be done on this. Currently, the the, um, the the there is no development proposed as a result of this application. It's a recognized, um, so it wouldn't be appropriate to do a a, a CEQA exemption that. And I understand, Judy, that's why it's confusing that that we're not proposing to do any work. So why is it an exemption that exempts work? So we're not making new findings, is what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. So understood. So the staff recommendation, given what you just said, the staff recommendation is that the project is exempt from further environmental review under the uh, California Quality Act in that it qualifies for class one and class three categorical exceptions. And then we, we approve the application. Given what you just said, do you, is that what you want us Yes, no, I would I would revise it to rather than the one and two to the mm -hmm. exemption, which is a uh, um, fifteen two. Let me give me just one moment. Two sixty uh, something. So you're suggesting another action. Why don't you just say what you? Would it would suggest? be it, yeah. So rather than class one and class three or class, uh, class two and class three, it would be the um, emergency exemption under um, CEQA guidelines 15269. You want to repeat that one more time? Emergency actions under CEQA guidelines 15269, emergency projects. Okay, so the fact that we're having a hearing on this and we're going to hear from the public is a little peculiar since the project is already done and we're yes. not going to undo it because it was emergency repair that was needed. So we're in a unique situation. That's, I just want to point that out. So I propose that we get, I don't see that we have much latitude here. Things done already. Matt, can you provide um, the revised language in the, um, for the action for that CEQA determination? Right now we have determined that the project is exempt. Um, should we just say um, affirm the project is exempt under emergency uh, action I, 15269 or what would that language be? I think it's the same language just about the 15269 for the class one and class two. Okay. Class, whichever they were, sorry. Okay. Here, can class I? Three and two. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so that we we should we should redo the uh, the CEQA exemption form, um, and I can work on that today. Uh, I can't get it done at this moment. Uh, it needs to be changed from the categorical exemption to the statutory exemption, and then the reasoning needs to be inserted in the bottom. Um, well, it would be good if staff recommendations could be accurate. I'm sure that this is a confusing situation, but I'm glad that we've straightened it out while we're about to have a hearing on it. Commissioner Dan, did you have something to add there? Um, yeah, I would suggest that if staff would like us to consider this modified CEQA exemption, that we take uh, a break long enough for them to put that in writing and send it to us in writing. This. From my perspective, actually, this application has a lot going on in it, and I am frankly not prepared 
to take action on a modified staff recommendation that's just verbally given to us. I don't think that that fits with this, uh, the, the, what we're dealing with with this application. So that would be my suggestion. And then it might afford some time for the commission to read the late correspondence as well. Yeah, I have to second yeah. Commissioner Dan on this because I, I agree that this application does have a lot going on and I really appreciate um, Mr. Johnston adding, well, first, Mr. Shepard bringing this up and then Mr. Johnston clarifying this, but I, I agree that I would, if we're talking about revising CEQA findings and actually he, he even mentioned revising the entire you know, document, I mean, that's something I would wanna read. Uh, before taking action. And I mean, I hate to even say this, but not only taking a break, but if necessary, continuing the item. Um, and I apologize to the applicant and I'm not saying we need to do that, but it, it just may be necessary because I would feel much more comfortable um, taking action on findings after having a chance to read them than, than taking action on something verbally given what I consider the complexity of this particular item. So I, I know we need to have a hearing because we need to hear from the public given that it's been duly noted, noticed. Um, but I just would like to share my thoughts um, and echo Commissioner Dan that I, um, I, I, at a minimum, would like to ensure that we have time to read those findings, and that means maybe a break. But I just want to put out there that for me, I, I might be inclined oh, um, to almost almost continue the item based on what Mr. Johnson right. has just shared. So I just want to be I just want to be candid with the public and with the commission about where I am at present. Thank you. Who is the applicant? Is it the county? No, the app, no. Well, let's stop the answer. Nate. You're muted, Nate. Mm -hmm. uh, the applicant is uh, ha Hamilton Land Planning. Uh, it's Deidre Hamilton and uh, it's Mark and <clears throat> Suzanne Cowles are the property owners. Well, maybe we, I agree, either continue it or take a break and rewrite it either way. It's good with me. If it's okay with your commission, I would see I I'm happy to work on that CEQA exemption. It is a it is a form um, that that I can easily modify to reflect Matt's revised recommendation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that sounds great. And so just to sum this up and try and get some direction here, you know, I don't know how much time we're all going to need, but I would hate to cram um, you know some review time into a short amount if we need a little more. Um, so I would be, you know, open to discussing a continuance or at least like a set time frame, and maybe moving on to, if nothing else, moving on to the next agenda item and coming back to this and give staff time to create um, and maybe ask time to think about whether or not we want to continue it or spend time on a break trying to figure it out. I think that's a fine idea to move on to the next item. Okay. Um, so can I just, so so Nathan is the planner for the next item. So we would need to take a, an actual break for okay. us to, to make that revision. And it is just a quick revised form um, that we would uh -huh. put together. It would, it would not take long. I'm wondering if you'd like to have the public hearing on this item before we move, move on. I didn't. We might want to take public comment just so that Mr. Macbeth can work on it during public comment. I mean, I don't know, Nathan, if, oh. work, if you can work during public comment or if you need to, I don't know if that works for you. I'm pretty much already done with it, but yeah, I'm happy to move <laughs> forward. <laughs> Not Thank too you. complicated. Can I, can, okay. I ask, can I ask one more question from staff? Please, Commissioner Shepard, go ahead. I, I am just still unclear. If, let's say we did not approve the findings, are we, I don't understand the consequences of a negative vote. Are we, you know, would we be voting to take the project apart? Or are we, are we really, is this just a, the thing's built already? What can we do if we say we don't like it for some reason? Yeah, that's a, a, another very good question. Um, <laughs> obviously we don't want to revert back to an unstable hillside, um, but um, yeah, I think if, if it, yeah, what what are the options? I mean, you guys can you, the commission can approve it uh, as recommended. You could modify it. Um, you can you know continue it. Um, that, that I think those are still options. But yeah, certainly removal of the fill slope is would be um, that would be potentially problematic. Yeah. Well, it would be very costly, and 
I don't think, so we are really looking at a bureaucratic action of one sort or another. I don't know that I agree with that, Commissioner Shepard. I mean, there are instances where emergency repairs require changes, and there's a reason that there's an action requiring a well, that's what I. That's what I long term, term per, long term permit. I mean, I'd let staff speak to that, but I, yeah. I would argue that there's a reason that we have distinctions between emergency permits and emergency repairs, and those that require uh, a, a, a longer term permits and longer term actions. And so, I, I, I wouldn't. I just don't want to understate the importance of these kind of two distinct actions. But I could let. I'd love to if I speak to that, but yeah, Jocelyn, go ahead. Yeah, if I may, I mean, Nate um, explained this, but I'll just kind of reiterate um, Nathan's statement, which is that for an emergency coastal permit, the purpose of those is to address an emergency situation. It's a quick action by staff, a quick CEQA exemption that we issue to just address the emergency to stabilize a slope, for example, after a, a major storm. So we, um, the department routinely issues emergency coastal permits, especially in the winter time, to address emergency situations. It's required by code that we follow up that emergency coastal permit with a formal coastal permit. And so we have a secondary action that we must take, which is a coastal permit where we make our coastal findings um, and determine if the project is consistent with the local coastal program and the coastal bindings. Um, and that is a typically either a level four or a level five coastal development permit. In this case, it's a level five coastal development permit, which went to the zoning administrator and he referred it up to the planning commission um, as described in the letter that we sent to you. And so Typically, there are no changes that we make between the work that was done at the emer emergency coastal permit phase and the formal coastal permit phase. Typically, the work's done similar to this project, and we're not recommending any revisions to that work. But sometimes they'll just go up, uh, you know, for example, for a bluff repair, you know, the applicant or the property owner will just plug a hole. And then when we're looking at the, the formal coastal permit, we'll say, hey, you need to do some planting around that shot creek. You need to color that shot creek. Um, you need to, you know, secure that pipe. That's the drainage pipe that's just kind of thrown out there to just address emergency drainage. So sometimes we will add conditions of approval to, um, to sort of, uh, you know, make that uh, project more consistent with our coastal permit uh, regulations if they if it's kind of sort of half you know half baked if they just kind of went out there and addressed the emergency but didn't really um, do a a, a full um, a full on uh, project at that time to really make it consistent with our coastal permit findings. In this case, staff is not recommending any further changes to the project, um, but that is something that the uh, planning commission could consider um, through conditions of approval and in, in reviewing this formal coastal permit. Well, thank you. That is a very good background and understanding. And now I have much firmer grasp of what's going on here. I'm, I'm ready to proceed now. And thank you. I wish that had been written up a little bit that way because it gives us a context. I couldn't make head or tail of this. Now I can. Great. Well, um, it sounds like we can move on to the public comment and uh, specifically the applicants. Um, excuse me, now I'm, <laughs> now I'm lost. All right, we can move on to the applicant's presentation at this time okay. and then uh, open public comment after that. Okay, so we'll start with the applicant and I see Deidre has her hand raised. Good morning, Deidre, please state your name for the record. Can you hear me now? Yes, good morning. Good morning, how are you? Um, I want to actually thank Commissioner Shepard for her questions because it, it is a little confusing and I, I myself have a better understanding about um, what is being decided. And in terms of how we wanna handle it, 
um, it, it sounds like it's just a form. And if, it, if it's the form that I'm familiar with, probably by the time I'm done talking, Nate will be done with that form. And I think that um, if we can have this heard today, I would much appreciate it. As you see, this has been a, um, a few years since the emergency permit and this permit has come before the commission. And we were disappointed with, with the zoning administrators sending it up to your commission, um, but here we are. But I really would like there not to be another continuance on top of that one and I don't know if that's still under consideration or not. Um, but I will say that since this is my time for presentation, I won't address any of the legal matters um, that you'll probably hear from the public. We do have the attorney um, present. His name is Ira Harris, and he should be on your, um, your Zoom um, list of participants. So if need be, he can address any of the legal um, matters. But I do just want to say, in terms of access to the beach, in terms of vistas, none of that has to do with this application. The application before you is to issue a coastal development permit for emergency work that was done under an emergency permit and approved by the county two years ago. The nexus that is trying to be um, made in this case just does not exist. Um, as Nate mentioned, we had, it was probably less than 50 cubic yards of grading involved in fixing this slump. Um, and as you see the, the drain pipe that was put in was a replacement for the drain pipe that unsuccessfully um, took water down the slope. So asking for all of these other things to be thrown into the mix um, just is not appropriate. There's no nexus and there's definitely no proportionality to it at all. Um, I would ask that your commission accept the exemption and approve the application with the work done as stated. Oh, and I did want to address our commissioner um, Legendby's question about the, um, the irrigation. The irrigation that was placed out there, I did go back and check with John Kasunich, who's our project engineer on that. And those, the irrigations were put there to water the plants so that they could establish themselves um, because as you know, we were having a drought. And as you saw when we were out there, the, the irrigation has successfully helped to keep the planting uh, alive. It is not connected at this time because uh, as you see, we've had significant rains um, and it is being monitored so that it doesn't cause any further erosion, but it's just there so that the planting can take hold and revegetate that slope so that it looks like it did before the emergency happened. Um, and with that, I'll stop right there. If anyone has any questions of me, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I would like to share my rebuttal time with the attorney because I think that there'll be some legal questions that may come up that I don't feel comfortable answering. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Ms. Hamilton, appreciate that. Um, would any commissioners have any questions, uh, Ms. Hamilton, before we move on to the rest of the public comment? Sounds like no. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Then let's do that. Let's uh, continue on with public comment. Ms. Drake, do we have other uh, members of the public that would like to speak at this time? Um, yes, I'll move on to Ira Harris, who I believe is part of the project team. Um, he has his hand raised, so uh, no timer for Ira. We'll go ahead and um, allow him to speak. Good morning. Will you please restate your name for the record? Yes, Ira James Harris. Mm -hmm. 
I'm counsel for Mark and Suzanne Caldwell's. Good morning. And, uh, I agree with um, Mr. Graham and Mr. Johnson that the paperwork with respect to the CEQA issues um, is properly, uh, should properly identify statutory code section 15.269. Uh, there are issues um, that have arisen with respect to the public regarding access. I have submitted in um, both our position paper back in October of 2020 and in supplements to Nathan since then uh, this year, uh, responding to each of those claims of public access by providing uh, aerial photographs of the area that show that there's been a fence there since the 1950s, uh, declarations from the homeowners that have been there since the 1950s that uh, a fence and gate has always been there and that despite there being an occasional trespasser over the years early on, that there hasn't been any uh, trespassing for the last couple decades. Um, that issue uh, has been raised with the commission and the county over the years that somehow some of these beachgoers have claimed that they had a historic uh, uh, access up that slope in some location. And each time the, the council or the, the planning commission or the coastal commission has investigated, they haven't found the exact location of any access and have told the uh, public that they need to file an action for prescriptive rights if they felt that they had such a prescriptive right. No one has ever filed, uh, but because that issue kept surfacing, and in response to a commission claim for administrative penalties for the vehicular gate that the county had approved in 2016, we went ahead and filed a lawsuit in uh, Santa Cruz Superior Court. And Judge uh, Timothy Volk Volkman has held that the Coastal Commission had no jurisdiction over the vehicular gate because no one had appealed that decision and the county had properly determined that it was exempt. Uh, the same thing with this mysterious uh, prior violation that they claim is an open violation. The records that have been submitted from the Coastal Commission's own files show that that alleged violation V-3-01-055 was associated with 60 Joffrey Drive, not 70 Joffrey Drive, and that it was resolved back in 1985-1986 with a requirement by the commission for the owner of that property at that time to dedicate a sandy portion of the beach down below. And that's the exact same number on that file. And they, they went ahead and did so. There's nothing in that open violation file uh, since then that to suggest that there's any claim that continues to be investigated. But nonetheless, we went ahead and quieted title to the public with Judge Volkman as well. On September 30th of this year, he quieted title, issued judgment. Now, the commission is appealing that decision, uh, but I suspect it will be promptly dismissed. But nonetheless, there's no stay on the enforcement of that judgment. And so that's the current state of the record with respect to any rights of public access. One, they, they were never established. No one ever responded. No one ever provided, uh, uh, filed any kind of quiet title or prescriptive right uh, claim. And it's now been resolved against them. And that judgment is still enforceable until it's over, overturned, which is very, very unlikely. Um, the key is here is that, is this a like kind repair? And you've heard from Mr. Macbeth that it was. There's been no further changes to the project, no further maintenance obligations that have been imposed, and therefore it is exempt from CEQA. And so that should properly be uh, the commission's finding. If I have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ira. Mm -hmm. All right, I will move on to members of the public. Um, each member of the public will have three minutes to provide comment. We will put a timer up. So when I call on you, please restate your name for the record. 
I will start with Eli Malgray. Good morning. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. My name is Elijah Mowbray, and I'm here to comment on this situation. Um, I submitted a letter. I submitted it late. I apologize. I did get it in, um, and I I have eight or nine points that are kind of summarize my concerns about the approval of this emergency permit. First and foremost, um, I grew up on 14th Avenue, and I, I regularly use this access point. So there's a lot of talk about there was an access route. There was access, and I, I walked between Black's Beach and the Cove hundreds of times as a kid. Um, so in my opinion, that's that's just simply not true. Um, the historical use of the coastal access is also supported by a great deal of additional evidence, um, other testimony from local residents, even the statements from previous owners, which are included in the packet material, which I believe is part of the quiet title um, documentation. Um, and also the county general plan, which states that the access here at this location is to be maintained. You only maintain existing access. You don't maintain access that doesn't exist. So that heavily infers that um, when that document was prepared in 1995, access existed. Same thing with the coastal overlook. I mean, if there was no access there, why would they have a coastal overlook in, in the general plan, in the local coastal pro program? Um, also, um, the Coastal Commission disagrees with many of the things that have been said about by the um, attorney for the uh, property owners. Um, I think that the beginning on page 40 of your staff agenda packet is um, a correspondence from Rainy Graven of the Coastal Commission, and she does a great job summarizing a lot of the issues. And um, your county code states that they're not supposed to approve permits if there's an outstanding violation. They, they believe there are outstanding violations, so I'm not sure you should approve the permit for that reason. But even if it's true that there's no public access at this point, which I believe there is, I would point out that Chapter 1505 of the county code requires the dedication of a coastal access easement um, at any local coastal, uh, any location appropriate for neighborhood shoreline access, which this is designated for neighborhood shoreline access. So they could, you could still require the dedication of an easement. They act like this project has no nexus to the coastal access, but the coastal access was exactly where this grading occurred, exactly in the same location. I mean, I used it many times. So it, there's a complete nexus between the two. And I think that chapter 1505 of the county code was not considered at all by the staff in the staff report. Um, also, by the way, a public access easement would entirely overlap other existing easements and wouldn't reduce the buildable area on those properties. I don't really know what the, how expensive it should be to take that if you had to take it by eminent domain. Um, the proposed emergency permit work, in fact, would make construction and development of the access more difficult. Um, people aren't talking about the fact that the fence is conflicting, obviously. The, grade, the drainage pipe was relocated to at grade instead of low grade. That would conflict with the construction of a, of a connection of the road. And then the reinforced earth soil reinforcing grids that are included in this new embankment would actually make it harder to build this too, potentially. Um, I have a lot of concerns about the staff report. I, I summarize those concerns. But it's not true that there's access to 200 feet east of the project. Flat out not true. That access is to a rocky shelf, not to Black Beach. Um, it's also not true that there's no there's an uncertainty of the location of this access point. There's no uncertainty of the location. And I don't think it's even relevant that when he says that um, it's not in the scope, the scope could include the public access requirements for the county code for this location. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eli. All right. Um, I will next call on um Gentleman by the name of Doug, uh, please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. My name is Doug Doherty. I live at 205 16th. <clears throat> so uh, looking at the uh, permit thing, they tried to sneak in a security fence as part of the emergency slope repair permit. Um, the reason I use the term sneak it in is because it's obvious in the application description that the uh, constructing that um, constructing the reinforced slope fill and erosion control and drains, that's actually addressing the problem of the slippage. But the chain link fence to serve as a quote safety rail, uh, th that really really belies what's going on here. Is it is a security fence is to prevent people from crossing there. If it was a safety rail. They would just remove the chain link part of the fence and it would serve as a rail. This fence is clearly designed as a security fence and as an obstruction to anyone trying to access the bluff top. The description shows they want to hide the function of the fence behind the description of safety rail. Remove the chain link and it will more resemble a rail. This fence has no function or relationship to repairing the slump slide uh, the failure, that's what the emergency permit is for, is the minimum construction required 
to repair the immediate problem, which is the slump failure. As far as I'm concerned, fences don't stop erosion. Um, so I would uh, ask the, the, the planners to uh, modify the approval to exclude the fence and not recognize the fence as part of this repair. That will address one of my main concerns. The second one is I'm kind of amazed that the uh, discouraged the planning commission doesn't even understand their own processes. Um, you know, I, I know that everybody, our, our citizens trying to do their best to help the community. So uh, I'm not gonna knock them for the dedication. But, um, you know, uh, Renee was a little bit confused about what we're doing here. Um, what we're doing here is recognizing this construction and all I'm asking for is to modify the recognition to exclude the fence part. Um, I'm a little bit upset with, you know, with the efforts uh, that Santa Cruz purports to support all these coastal access plans, but when a push comes to shove, they never actually do anything about it. And they, they help represent private interests and, and do very poorly at representing the public access issues and, and using our coastal resource. So that's all I have to say. I, I, I hope that uh, the Planning Commission would modify the approval to exclude and review the function of the fence. Thanks. This is Melissa with CTV. Um, Jocelyn had to reconnect. Um, so I will continue to um, move this along with uh, speaker Mike Gutt. Great, thank you. Okay. okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, because I can't, you. okay, there we go. Okay, so, um, Hello, everybody. Hello, former colleagues. I've got only three minutes, so I'm going to have to move along. Um, there's way more going on than any kind of rubber stamp of a prior emergency permit. And I was disappointed to hear staff discussion about what's going on here. There is absolutely no vested right whatsoever in anything that was granted under the emergency permit. I'll also say, though, in like the dozens of people who spoke at the ZA hearing, nobody's talking about undoing the slough repair. It's what conditions are appropriate and what other parts of the project might have to be taken out. Uh, it is absolutely normal to have new conditions or sometimes removal of part of emergency projects and in extreme cases, ripping the whole thing out, which nobody's talking about here. But this is a complete new hearing on this material, despite what you might have heard from staff. So if you go to page 243 of your package, 243, you'll see a Coastal Commission staff letter. It's the third on this project. That's not just from a few staff members. My understanding that's after detailed discussions between their reviewing staff, their enforcement staff, and their legal teams. They are not messing around. There are open violations. These violations don't have to do with like a far end of a two mile long property where now they've got a, despite uh, Ms. Hamilton's claims, there's nexus, nexus, nexus here. These. Re, uh, violations need to be resolved before we can give a new coastal development permit on a project that's right in the area of where the violations, the nexus is right there. Could maybe give this permit, for example, pulling the fence and saying it only becomes effective after resolution of the open violations. But otherwise, we have a responsibility to follow our county code, which says we can't give coastal development permits when there's this kind of circumstance going on. I'm going to briefly respond to Mr. Harris's talk about uh, the lawsuit. I know this is not a legal forum. For hearings such as this, there are signs on the property, big signs, notice of development, uh, project, hearing, all this stuff. They used to be smaller. I worked with Jan Buttes to get these big signs put up. But for this quiet title action against the public, I'd ask you to please look at page 200. That's 200 of your package. And you'll see the only public notice of the quiet title action which was a printout in the Sentinel that didn't list the property name, the geographic location, or the APN. And the applicant's counsel had the temerity at the ZA hearing to say no evidence was presented. Well, the county, he, the, the applicant certainly knew that the coastal file 
lists 23 people who had already gone on the record in writing about access here. There's a half dozen at the last hearing. And I'm, it's unfortunate that I'm running out of time because three minutes is not enough to do justice to what's going on here. But don't expect the legal rulings on this parcel to hold up. This is a critical item for continuity along the walking on this area, and you should not approve this permit as presented. I only have three minutes. Great to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutter. We will um, move on to a Bill Parkin. Mr. Parkin, you should be unmuted. Oops. Sorry, Mr. Parkin. Can you, you hear, hear us now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, members of the commission. Bill Parkin, counsel for Tom Mader, a uh, citizen very concerned about this project and public access. Um, first, I do want to clarify, as other members of the public have spoken, about the emergency permit process. Um, under County Code 1320090C, all emergency development pursuant to an emergency coastal development permit is considered temporary. So this is not pro forma, actually, uh, and not only imposing new conditions or requiring other work, but uh, structures and improvements made pursuant to an emergency permit can actually be removed. This happens all the time. If you talk to coastal staff, that's the way the process works. Someone gets permission to put riprap down on the beach, they may be required to remove it later to do some other type of improvement. So the damage to the the damage to the slope, and as one as other members of the public have pointed out, um, the emergency permit went beyond dealing with the damage to the slope. That fence, that safety fence, was a new fence put up. It was unnecessary to deal with the emergency. And so the commission has the right and the ability to have that fence removed pursuant to, the, to this formal coastal development permit, which legitimizes any emergency work. There's no reason for the fence. And clearly it's an attempt to bootstrap in uh, the fence into the emergency permit in order to bolster the applicant's uh, contentions in its litigation about excluding the public. And so I, I urge the commission to uh, not approve the coastal development permit to include the fence. Um, also, as Mr. Macbeth pointed out, the damage caused to the slope was caused by the drainage. We don't know whether the new drainage is actually adequate uh, to deal and to prevent uh, future slides. Um, and then getting to the emergency uh, exception under CEQA, it's kind of a moving target. I commented in my letter that class one and class three exemptions did not apply. Now staff this morning is saying that the emergency exemption applies basically based on the emergency permit. Well, there's no more exigent circumstance. There's no more emergency. So the emergency exemption doesn't apply. As I pointed out in my letter that was submitted yesterday morning, under county code section 1320.170C, a development uh, for a, a CDP cannot be approved for development proposed uh, until the, all former violations are resolved. And the other violations that the commission, the Coastal Commission staff has pointed out have not been resolved. And therefore, we don't believe a CDP can even be approved. But again, the fence should not be bootstrapped in. It was not legitimate under the emergency authorization. And uh, this commission has the ability to deny a CDP to include the fence. The fence should not be used as uh, a cudgel to help the applicants in their litigation. I appreciate your consideration this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Parkin. The next hand I see is uh, Ali Webster. Hello, my name is Allison Webster. I'm speaking with Surf Rider Foundation Santa Cruz chapter. Um, I wanted to comment briefly just to say that we strongly oppose this project um, for the reasons that are outlined in the Coastal Commission's 2020 letter um, to the Santa Cruz County Planning Department. Uh, they have not been addressed or mitigated at all in these follow-up coastal development permit considerations. To speak to the earlier discussion, the purpose of this meeting is to make sure that the kind of work that gets permitted 
permitted in emergencies doesn't get perpetuated when it has other negative impacts that can be avoided or mitigated for. Our coastline should not look like the aftermath of a landslide in perpetuity. With denial decision today, the applicant will have to adjust this project so that the public access is better facilitated and or so that the public can be compensated for its lost access or lost beaches due to erosion caused by the armoring that was originally only permitted because of an emergency. The negative impacts of this project, including its violations of the Coastal Act, have not been properly discussed or considered otherwise. As has been said, the fence, at the very least, would not be part of this, should not be part of this project. A major negative impact is that this project gets in the way of potential restored coastal access in the area, which violates the Coastal Act and our own LCP. Coastal access, coastal access at Jeffrey Drive has been degraded and privatized, and the county should not be reinforcing development in an area that is still being fought over for prescriptive access rights. This area represents an opportunity to access Black's Beach, which is not otherwise accessible by the other paths described today by staff such as the one uh, located 200 feet east of the site. Um, of particular note is this project's violation of section um, 3211 of the Coastal Act, which prohibits development from interfering with the public's right of access to the sea. This is directly relevant at this location as the Coastal Commission staff made clear in that 2020 letter. The county should be advancing the public interest to access at the beach in this area, but regardless of access disputes, other major concern for Surfrider is that the erosion control grid is armoring for a new development. It's absurd to think that the Coastal Commission would approve this under the Coastal Act Section 30235, which approves armoring for structures that were existing before the Coastal Act was enacted in 1976. The driveway is not such a structure warranting protection and has been completely redone since the Coastal Act. The armoring access gets in the way of a potential coastal access trail where both our LCP and the Coastal Act seek to maximize public access. The county needs to uphold our rights to access and enjoy our beaches in Santa Cruz, and the considerations made in this permit is a place to start. We urge you to deny this flawed permit until the impacts to public access and armoring have been properly considered. Thank you. Thank you. I am back. Sorry about that. Um, have we heard from, let's see, I see no hands raised except for the applicant. All right. I think that if there's no one else, uh, no, no other members of the public that would like to speak, then we can come bring it back to the applicant for a rebuttal time period. And Ms. Drake, what do we have for a time limit on this? Uh, five minutes. Um, I'll start with Ira. Ira, did you have some follow-up comments? Yes, I do. Okay. First of all, it's important to realize, and it's in your packet um, uh, uh, attached to the letters that I have submitted both to um, uh, the county and in response to the Coastal Commission's um, objections. Uh, the alleged access that they're talking about, this historical access that no one's been able to identify exactly where it was on this slope. Uh, the, the commission and the county's records clearly indicate that over the decades that they have inspected, have not been able to determine where uh, the, the, the public claimed they had some access at some time nor whether or not it was a, a, a access that extended over a period of time that uh, any prescriptive rights would have accrued. They've consistently referred the public to the courts. No one's ever afforded uh, their opportunity to prove the existence of any prescriptive rights. And the, the county and the commission's records clearly indicate the problem with the nexus that Deidre had identified, which is that this private driveway that goes down the uh, bluff top off of Joffrey Drive serves five different properties. It's not simply 70 Joffrey Drive. It's 60, it's 70, it's 80, it's 90, and it's 63 Joffrey Drive. So you have to tre uh, trespass across five different properties to get to Joffrey Drive and at least two to get from Black's Beach up to 70 uh, Joffrey. 
So you, you can't, there's no nexus with this property to provide public access because someone would have to go across 63 to get up to 70 from the beach and you'd have to go through all five properties to get down to 70 to have some visual display. With respect to the fence, the aerial photos show that the fence was there in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Even the county and, and commission's own records identify the fence. The photograph that Mr. Macbeth had on uh, with the two people standing on the drain, looking down the slope that had just failed, shows a fence. The fence was a like-kind replacement for what was already there. That's why there was no change uh, noted by the planning staff. Uh, in terms of the status of the litigation, the litigation has been resolved. Both of those alleged violations are contingent upon public access existing. Judge Volkman has ruled against them in both instances. They've indicated that the commission had no jurisdiction with respect to the vehicular gate and fence that the, the county had approved as exempt in 2016. They made that ruling August 10 of 2020. They failed to appeal it timely. They're trying to belatedly do that now, but it's going to fail. But they did not stay that action, so it's still enforceable. On the other alleged violation of public access, we've quieted title to the, to the members of the public on that. Again, they're appealing that, but it's not stayed. And so what's currently before the commission is a judgment against both of those. So there's no, quote, open violations whatsoever that the that you can consider frankly there are aerial photographs declarations in the county and commission's own records identify the absence of any specific location for this access they identify the existence of the fence they uh, totally undermine these claims that there's some historical right of access along that slope. And more importantly, the Coastal Commission has no jurisdiction to determine if there are prescriptive rights. The case of LT-WRLLC versus California Coastal Commission at 152 Cal App 4th 770 at page 805 and 806 definitively states that prescriptive rights have to be determined by the court. The Coastal Commission has no right to say, hey, we we're going to hold you in violation because someone in the public claims that they traversed your property for the prescriptive period. And so with that, I, I submit it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Um, Deidre does have her hand raised. Uh, Chair, I'll leave it up to you since we're at the five minutes, if you want to provide some time for. Yeah, if we could just give her a couple minutes really quickly. Okay. All right, Deidre. I actually um, have lowered my hand. I think I recovered it um, pretty well. The, the public is trying to tie things that are settled with the court to this application. We're just asking for you to follow the staff's recommendation and approve the project as the emergency permit stated and to recognize the exemption as staff, I'm sure by this point has rewritten. And I won't, I won't say any more than that. Thank you. Thank you, Deidre. All right, I'll turn it back over to you now, Chair. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your comments. We really appreciate it. And um, so we'll close the public comment at this time and move it back to the commission for discussion. Uh, would any commissioners like to start off? Um, I don't mind starting. Go ahead, Commissioner Dan. Um, so I, I'd like to thank staff for their work on this and, um, and all the folks that showed up today and spoke. We appreciate your comments and uh, you always uh, help the process. Um, so I will just say that where I am right now, um, I am not able to support this application and I'll give you some reasons why. Um, and then we can we can discuss we can discuss it as a commission. 
Um, I would just say that I think, you know, I went through the entire packet. It was voluminous. There was loads of information. Um, you know, I read the staff report and thought, oh, okay, this is this is a relatively simple emergency CDP after the fact. And then reading through the packet, you uh, come, I came to understand that there's a lot more going on here um, than what what um, what was presented in the staff report. Um, though, and I want to appreciate staff for giving us all of that information. Um, very helpful, and so and, and so I want to appreciate our staff for being uh, transparent and giving us the information that we need in order to make a sound determination on this. So I would just say that in the packet, first of all, I'll start with that I believe the historic access of this um, on this property is well documented from my perspective, um, from what I read in the packet. Um, I also would say that uh, from what I understand, uh, the issue of access is at the very beginning of the legal process. And so I wouldn't, uh, in my view, I wouldn't say that it's at all settled um, and that throughout the state, with regard to um, uh, prescriptive rights and access for the public to the coast that these uh, proceedings often take years um, to get resolved. And there are many cases where the public's right to access the coast has only been upheld at the terminus of the uh, legal process. So um, to me, that's it's not at all settled. Um, so I would say specifically with this application, um, I cannot support the CDP permit findings. Um, so specifically, I can't make number two, number four, number five, and number six. And I can go into specifics as to why I can't support those findings. I'd also say that the perm, this permit covers uh, the fence. Uh, the fence, from my understanding from the packet, uh, never received a coastal permit to begin with. And I believe that um, there's evidence in the record from the previous owner of this property who stipulated that they erected the fence specifically to keep the public out. So the previous owner has stated that they that the public did have access through this their property and they put up the fence specifically to keep the public out because they felt the public was um, trespassing on their property. Uh, so in addition, um, I believe that the emergency work, I, I agree with uh, the 2021 coastal staff letter that discussed whether or not the fence was in kind and the emergency work went well beyond a like kind repair. Uh, from the evidence in the record, I would agree with that. And then, although I understand our staff, we are changing the recommendation for the CEQA exemption. I haven't seen that yet. So I'll just say that from what was in the record that I cannot support the CEQA exemption um, and for reasons outlined in the Park and, and Goof letters. Uh, and so that's where I am right now. Um, and I'd like to hear what my fellow commissioners uh, think as well. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. Any other commissioners like to go next? Can I ask a follow-up question of staff, actually, based on some public comment? Mr. McBeth, are you still with us? Yes, I am. So to both Commissioner Dan and a lot of the public comments, you know, there's been this discussion about the, the fence along the bluff in particular and whether or not it was they keep calling it a like in you know in kind replacement, but it it, it seems based on some testimony and, and many of the materials in the packet, was this was it a permitted in existence? Had it been permitted through the Coastal Commission? Had it been permitted through the county? Can you can you maybe perhaps speak to the not not whether or not it existed, but whether or not it was a permitted. Fence, because I'm, I, I agree with Commissioner Dan that I'm, I'm a little confused about why a fence would be included in an emergency permit. So it, it would be on kind of the emergency repair. So could you speak to the permitted nature of that fence before the repair? That would be helpful. Sure. I, I don't have record of a permit having been issued specifically for the fence, but I will say to, to your point that a fence has 
existed there in the past and this project was intended to replace an existing fence. Okay, thank you, that's helpful because I, I thank you, that's helpful. You're welcome. Hey, uh, Commissioner Lazenby or Shepard, did you have any other questions or comments? I'm still um, reviewing the findings that uh, Commissioner Dan had objected to. So I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Commissioner Shepard go ahead. Uh, I have no additional questions at this time. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions just to follow up with staff also that kind of came out of the discussion there. Um, you know, as it relates to actual public access, you know, can you enlighten me a little bit on the process of a prescriptive easement and if that exists or not? And if not, like, what's the process? Does this, and then follow up is, does this application preclude anything like that from continuing to happen outside of this application? Um, well, yeah, I think, I think, for for some of your question, I would have to defer to council. Um, but yeah, as stated in the staff report, this this project in itself would not preclude uh, a future um, effort or improvement to establish or construct uh, public access at the project site. Um, the intent of this project is simply to stabilize that slope and to keep it safe from you know people falling off of it. Um, the matter of public access um, doesn't necessarily need to be addressed at this point to the extent that it's already been um, discussed in, in, in the correspondence. Chair Gordon, was that a question regarding prescriptive access that I could provide some enlightenment on? Uh, yeah, I think that what Nathan said was great. Um, effectively, you know, this doesn't preclude any kind of public access challenges that you know may exist um and i guess the my other question was like what's that process maybe not as important um after hearing nate but what you know what well, maybe it may be important what is that process so as, as you heard from uh, many of the uh in public comment and particularly from the surf rider representative uh there's an argument that the right that the public has a prescriptive right of access over this property uh Prescriptive right of access is essentially a right of use that is uh, to access uh, across a property that is contrary to the underlying property owner's interests. It's open, notorious, and hostile to that property owner's interests. And it arises through continuous use that is not interfered with by the property owner. Um, it takes the form uh, when ultimately adjudicated of an easement for access. Here, though, we have a quiet title uh, judgment uh, from the Superior Court, uh, and it's, it starts at page 274 of your packet that says there is no public right of access over this property. So there is no easement of access over the property um, as determined by the court. That judgment is under appeal. That appeal remains undetermined, but at this point in time, the judgment from the Superior Court is final and that determination is uh, stands uh, and remains uh, essentially a judicial determination that the public cannot access over this property. Now, as to whether or not a prescriptive right could arise in the future, the answer is yes, the public would have to make use and continuously trespass over this property and then establish a, uh, and then essentially quiet title uh, to establish a prescriptive right. Um, whether that would happen is not before us right now. Um, if, as to your question, whether or not public access could be developed in the future, uh, yes, uh, that might be a determination that would be made on a future building permit or, or future coastal development permit for the site. Um, but it doesn't, but staff has not provided any information that would suggest that um, such an exaction would have nexus and proportionality for the in relation to the uh, 
permit that is before the commission for consideration right now. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I appreciate that. And so to kind of sum it up here in my own words, um, essentially the court said there's no access. It's not up to us in this meeting to determine that um, or even assume that there is access because we have a ruling that there is no access at this point. That's correct. Can I just ask, uh, Commissioner Gordon, can I just ask one question of counsel? The judgment was about a quick claim. Was the judgment, was that one of the rulings was about prescriptive access or does it go along with a quick claim decision that there is no access? In other words, has they, have the, was part of this petition before Superior Court asking for access? So based, there, on a, based on a claim of prescriptive right? There are two, there are two uh, judgments in this action. One is a mandamus action relating to the outstanding coastal uh, notices of violation, which determined, uh, as I read it, that there were, uh, that coastal has no outstanding violations. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is a second judgment, which starts on page 274 of your packet, which deals with the uh, second and third act causes of action quieting title. Um, I don't know that there was a quit claim issue, but there was a quiet title action, which is essentially an action saying, let's determine all rights in this property. Uh, ah. and, and in fact, what you have here is specifically a determination that the public doesn't have an easement of access over this. Uh, and the only um, interests uh, in land that exist on these properties are the ones that are um, recorded on title. So there is no prescriptive right. So that was yes, specifically adjudicated. Um, there, you know, as noted by other speakers, there was a publication, which uh, whether or not it, that publication was sufficient to put members of the public on notice that this issue was being adjudicated is an issue that's before the court and not before this commission. Uh, but the judgment here was um, dealing with uh, essentially prescriptive rights and determined that there were none. Since they are, you know, this decision comes down if it if the appeal is not successful, could any members of the public in the future try to establish prescriptive rights, or does this judgment prevent that from happening in the future? Well, well, again, prescriptive rights are established through continuous use that is hostile to the underlying property owner, legally hostile to the underlying property and owner's interests. So. If members of the public were to keep using this in contrary, uh, essentially to keep trespassing uh, to the point where uh, there is an open, notorious, and continuous use of this property, they might have standing to bring uh, uh, to buy a title for a prescriptive easement. But that hasn't happened. And right now, the court has determined that there is no prescriptive right here. Okay. So you have to have the, the, app, the uh, term that's important here is continuous. So you would have to prove that people have continued to use it. Essentially, but that, that's one of the factors, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and two other follow-up questions. Um, you know, there's contradictory evidence of, or discussion, I would say, and not evidence um, of open violations on this property. Can, can you just clear that up for me, uh, Mr. McBath, or whoever's most suited to answer that? Yeah, I'd be happy to take that one. There are no open uh, code enforcement uh, actions or violations on the subject property um, that the county has issued. Okay, so we aren't so, precluded so I, to. Can I, Commissioner? Yeah, please go ahead. There, so that that's a little confusing, Nathan, um, since there are numerous uh, code violations uh, that the Coastal Commission is investigating and has been, uh, the, that is part of our packet. Isn't yeah, I, yeah, I, under, I understand that. Um, there, there, we, we do have two separate re regulatory, uh, um, I, I would, um, if Matt Johnston is still on, he is also not just our environmental coordinator, he's also in charge of, um, or code enforcement, he may be able to explain um, a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Interface between coastal and us. 
Uh, Coastal has their own enforcement. We have our own enforcement. We respond to complaints. We have not received any complaints to the planning department code compliance regarding this parcel since 1990. Um, code, the, the enforcement arm of Coastal often works with us. At this point, we have not established a violation on this parcel through our coordination with the Coastal, Coastal Commission. Um, and it's fairly common. There are a lot of cases that where the Coastal Commission identifies a violation on a property um, and it stands for several years and they do their own enforcement. There are times where we coordinate. We have other violations as well, um, building on a, on a coastal bluff without permits and such. Um, this one has not risen to that level. So as others have pointed out, and I guess my question is, if it's not a county violation, are we, does that affect whether or not we can make a determination because there's technically not an open violation in the county? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, the regulate, I mean, our, our code is specific to our code. I mean, if, if another state agency has an open investigation um, or have noted, have, have noticed and proven that there is a violation, um, that doesn't, that's not our code. We don't enforce other state, the state violations unless it's something that we are coordinating with and we both have open cases. Uh, in this case, we don't have an open case. On. Excuse me, I have a follow-up question to that though, because we are, we are in, what our job here right now, what we are being asked to do is issue the coastal development permit on behalf of the Coastal Commission. We have to make specific findings um, under our code that conform with the Coastal Act. So, I mean, I think, like that, that's factually true that the county has no open code enforcement cases, but I believe it is an important factor that the there are open violations that have been ongoing on this property that the Coastal Commission staff has determined are in violation of the Coastal Act and our LCP. So right. there, there is some connection there that I, can... I and I can't speak to the coastal the the implementation of the LCP regarding that. That's not. I I would just say that the coastal commission staff and county staff are not always in perfect alignment on our interpretation of uh, the county's LCP policies, um, and it's not infrequent that there's a disagreement in how to apply those policies. And that is true in cases of violations as well. Did you have any other follow-up there, Commissioner Dan? Um, the last question I had did regard the fence. And, you know, replacing kind of, can't remember, the pictures look like with maybe a wood fence or something before and now it's this chain link fence. So maybe not exactly the same, but still a fence nonetheless. Um, I guess my question is, you know, is this fence, if you're just gonna put this fence up, what's the process? Does someone have to get a permit for this fence? It's private property, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly with this because of the location with the beach and all this stuff. So can you help me understand that? Yeah, due, due to the, the location of the fence, a coastal development permit would be required under our current uh, regulations. Um, fences are typically um, ancillary to some other type of development, uh, whether it be like a remodel of the home. So we don't see a lot of standalone uh, fence applications. Uh, in this case, it um, is viewed by county staff as a replacement of an existing fence. Um, the wood fence that you referred to was uh, temporary um, uh, during the during the slide. Uh, so in some of the um, other frames from that slide, you can see the actual chain link fence that had been kind of rolled back, pulled away from the slope to gain access. Um, but um, but yeah, that would be the process, it would be a separate uh, application if it wasn't included in a larger project. Okay, that makes sense. And is the applicant allowed to add that fence in this application? Yes, they are. Okay, so they could, in theory, put, you know, apply for any type of fence with this application. It doesn't necessarily have to be exactly what was there because of the emergency. This is the opportunity to make it right and add a fence that they wanted to. Um, I, I think if 
we we could consider a revised design or something like that if, if that's what what you mean um no i guess i'm just or, asking process wise just to confirm that this is an appropriate time for them to add a fence is this application it's an appropriate time to add the fence okay thank you oh go ahead Go ahead, go ahead, Allison. I am done with questions, so yeah, I didn't catch yours first, Commissioner Violante. I suppose. Go ahead. Yeah, I just I was hoping Mr. Macbeth could clarify his statements because I I see this application as I mean when I read the staff report it says a permit to recognize the the emergency development permit and I I want to clarify Chair Gordon's comments because I or maybe Mr. Macbeth's response about the fact that is this the appropriate time or would this be the appropriate time to add something to an emergency development permit and I I'm hoping for some clarity because I, I see this application as a as a recognition of an emergency permit versus um if they were to I'm trying to think of an example of like <laughs> Add something like an ADU or a over height fence, some, some, something that wasn't part of the emergency permit. I don't see this as the appropriate time. I see this as a recognition of it. I, I mean, an amendment to the emergency repair, absolutely. Um, but uh, the addition of something I, is not. And I see. Maybe clarity on on what you just said because this this was an unpermitted fence, and I, I I'm hoping you can clarify that. This is a recognition of their emergency work and a construction of it, not just the opportunity to add something. Right. I mean, for for this, it's a, for all intents and purposes, this is a, a regular coastal development permit, um, and so and so. Yeah. To to that point, yeah, you, it would be the time to to do. You know, you could do anything, but really, the the scope of the work is to recognize. The, the primary reason is to to recognize the the fill slope and to repair that the the failure. Um, as part of that um, repair, a fence was installed. Um, and again, it's up, it's in, it's in place. It was intended to re replace an existing fence. And so this is the same. Uh, to clarify my statement, this would be an appropriate time to recognize the placement of that replace replacement fence. Right. It includes it includes the fence, this coastal permit, and it could be modified through this coastal permit. Matt, yeah, has I guess I'm up. just I'm just yeah. trying to understand the distinction though about that this is what we're doing today is recognizing the emergency work repair under a, a kind of traditional permit. We're not this wasn't this isn't an application to and this is kind of an odd one because the emergency repair is the same as the regular permit, but I, I'm trying to clarify that this so I, I have a, an example of a similar permit um, with the CZU fire and PG&E went and cut down a whole bunch of trees and, and they, they got stopped. They did an emergency permit to recognize trees that were removed and the follow-up permit included the trees that were not specific emergencies, um, but that still needed to be removed and it included some road repair. So in this case, you have an emergency permit to repair the slope and the follow-up permit that include can include other aspects such as the fence along the top or other appurtenant things, or even if they wanted to do further development, that would be your, you could bifurcate that and say, no, that should be part of a separate one. But in this case, with the fence that is on the repair and there was a pre existing fence there, it makes sense that it not be included in the emergency permit, but it, it would be considered under the follow up coastal development permit. Can I, can I jump in here? I think the, for me at least, the important distinction is that the fence was not permitted to begin with. And if you look at page 246 of our packet, uh, the, the Coastal Commission letter talks about this. And I think that this is in a very important distinction um, in that it says, a fence at this location has never been authorized by a CDP in the nearly 50 years since CDPs were first required. Um, replacement of unauthorized and illegal development cannot constitute a like kind repair. So I just think, for me at least, I'm just pointing out this is a key element uh, of, of the what we're dealing with here that's important to, um, well, it's important for me to point out. 
Well, and Mr. Johnson, I just would also like clarity. You're telling me that the fence was not included in the emergency repair and they've added it because I thought at the beginning we were all told that everything was the same under the emergency repair as today's permit. And that, and that makes me very confused because I was under the impression that the slope repair, the fence was all under the emergency repair. Um, at, and so it was all under today's kind of traditional regular CDP. And to Ms. Dan's point, to, to Ms. Dan's point, the, the fence should not be included in a like repair. And it goes, in my opinion, goes beyond the fence goes beyond the scope of an emergency. And so I'm, I, that's what I'm trying to under the, understand the distinction. Um, because to me, these are very relevant points to today's application. Right. So my understanding is the fence was installed at the time of the repair. It was installed as a replacement for, of an existing fence. The emergency repair itself was for the slope. Um, and the and I that's that's as far as I mean I again I came into this today so and the coastal permit now is to recognize all of that work the emergency repair yeah. work and the fence um, and the fence can be modified through this coastal permit um, should the planning commission wish to do so Mr. Macbeth can you please clarify then about whether or not the fence was included in the emergency repair and the emergency approval yeah. for me I just think that's really a really an important distinction um yeah, uh, I think um, for for me, I, I try to think about it as to the the original the, the the grading and emergency coastal development permit was intended to restore the site to as best could be its pre failure condition. It had a drain inlet, it had a drain pipe running down the slope, and it had a fence at the top of the slope. So as part of the emergency coastal development permit, all of the site improvements that are before you today were installed, approved, inspected. So it's the way, kind of the way that we look at this permit is to say, yes, we're recognizing the emergency piece, which was the slope failure, right? That's what's going to cause, you know, somebody to really get hurt. The fence was in the way of the work. And so as part of that, pulled back, the work completed, and the fence put back in place. Um, Mm -hmm. That's that's really what it is. So in 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 the end, the regular development permit, coastal development permit, covers it all. Thanks, Nate. That was that was helpful to me. So the fence was there previously. Part of the previous is CEQA determination, all approved. You know, just to be really clear on that, that's what we're saying. Correct. It existed, Chair Gordon, but for me, it was an unpermitted fence that was put in for the purpose of keeping people out, which is, it, we're not here to make the determination, as Council mentioned about prescriptive easements, easements, but it was literally put in for the purpose of preventing people from using it as a prescriptive easement, um, which led to them being able to quiet title. Um, and. I don't know, for me, it's, I don't know how the, you know, Commissioner Dan referenced the letter that says that this fence cannot be included in a like kind repair, and we're talking about replacing an unpermitted fence. Uh, and all of this lump, the slump, the, the slide, obviously, is an emergency. They were able to replace it, but I, I struggle a little bit to understand why the fence uh, needs to be recognized. I understand you know, that we're at this interesting place that the prescriptive easement is under appeal and, you know, the court has determined that there's not an easement there, but um, I, I just don't know whether or not for me, we can justify, you know, kind of sanctioning this fence as part of an emergency repair um, and then put the coastal development permit when there's an unsettled case out there. I just, that's where I'm struggling with a little bit personally, um, given that it was yeah. an unpermitted fence and we'd be essentially permitting it when there's an unsettled case. And so uh, I think it was, I think it was the member of the public, Mr. Goose, who said that perhaps we would say that it could only go in once that case is settled kind of thing. I, um, Chair Gordon, I had a uh, question. Um, we can change or modify the fence. We, mm -hmm. And we could also ask that there be a gate in it. I do see myself personally that some kind of fence, whether it's an open fence, a chain fence, whatever, it's just a safety feature. If you drive down the end of that road with little kids, you don't want them tiptoeing over the top. So I don't have an objection, especially if there was a fence there. We can 
change the nature of the fence. But I am a little um, befuddled by the fact that if we were like to put a gate in it or make it a very accessible fence, then we right now are in the prohibition of the Superior Court saying, unless till the appeals heard that there is no right to um, access there. And that, that's a pretty strong prohibition. So we're between a rock and a hard place till that feeling, till that appeal is determined. Um, yeah. I, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Chair. Go oh, ahead. sure. Okay, no problem. Uh, I just say that, you know, I agree that it's a tricky spot, but with the facts that we have, you know, that there's no public easement that we can consider, you know, that that shouldn't make a determination as to what kind of fence we say would be allowed, in my opinion. Um, but my question here is, okay, so say that, you know, I'm really interested in this, this topic of if the fence was technically allowed to be put back in in the emergency use permit if it was not permitted in the first place. And so, because right now what I believe we're saying is that we're using the CEQA determination from the emergency use permit, but if we're also saying that the fence you know, maybe shouldn't have been included, then are we saying that that secret determination was incorrect in the first place? And that's what we're using to determine this project. And I don't know who's supposed to answer that. <laughs> um, um, I, I think I can take a stab at it. Um, okay. I'm gonna be forwarding you a revised CEQA determination. It'll include the all the language that, um, Matt Johnston provided you regarding the applicability of the emergency uh, statutory exemption, as well as a, um, a a categorical exemption for the fence. Uh, two separate uh, CEQA determinations, um, and I think that 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 should um, address um, that piece. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Dan, go ahead. Thanks for letting me jump in there. Of course. Um, so, for me, I, um, for me, I, I like I, I started out with saying um, it's a matter of of not being able to make a number of the CDP findings. Um, so, I cannot support affirmatively support issuing uh, a coastal development permit when I believe that they violate the majority of the findings. Um, I also don't know that the CEQA exemption um, um, is acceptable even as revised. Um, so just to move us along, just, and I don't know where this will go, and um, but I'm going to try to make a motion. Don't know if it'll get a second. If it doesn't, that's fine, but I'm going to, I'm going to make an attempt just to move us along. Um, so we don't get quagmired. Um, so I'm going to move uh, to determine that the project is not exempt from environmental review and move to deny application 201302 and ask staff to return with findings for denial. Um, that's my motion. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Dan. Um, <laughs> would any commissioners want to second that motion? Can I ask a clarifying question? Because Ms. Dan, do you and is it or maybe it's a question to staff or, or Ms. Dan? Is it or to staff? Is it possible to approve just the slump repair today and not the fence, or do we have to take it as a whole? Because I don't know if Ms. Dan would be interested in in approving at least the repair component. Or maybe this is a moot point, so maybe I should start with Ms. Dan. I think that if there was a recommendation and findings crafted to just speak to the, the slope repair. I think it's possible that after I took a look at that, I'd be able to evaluate that. I think that the, that there's been some questions brought up um, about the actual repair work done, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that that would, that, that would have been something to take a look at. So then my question to staff is, is that even possible that we can, or does, do we have to take it as a whole? Um, no, I think, um, yeah, you can, you can approve um, the project as a whole or in part uh, revise the project as you see appropriate. Um, there are 
some, maybe perhaps some technical questions about you know, a, a full denial of the project and where that leaves us having the work, you know, given the work has already been completed. Um, and would we remove that work or just that's, that's sort of, I have, you know, other questions like that. I think. Commissioner Gordon. Um, Give me uh, one sec here, Commissioner Dan. I know we have a motion on the floor, and typically we go for a second uh, before discussion. Or that's right. And if there's no second, it dies for lack of second. So we should... we're okay to continue discussion. Okay. I'm no, it needs. Oh, sorry. Just, it needs a second. It needs a second. I just wanted to know whether or not I should second it because I'm. If, if we can't bifurcate, I'm willing to second it and move on. I just if if that's all. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we discuss after a second? We can get a second and discuss. I heard a second from Violante. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if that was an official. I said, oh, oh, thank I'm sorry. you. Sorry. I, I, that's why I asked my clarifying question because if we can't, um, right. Sure, I, I can. I, I, the problem is, I might want to make an alternative motion to bifurcate. That's why I wanted to ask my question. So. Under so, so we've had a second and we're under discussion. No, no, no. Commissioner Shepard, no second yet. So okay. uh, I don't sorry. sorry. My mistake. That's okay. I was trying to second the motion. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. That was Judy. Okay. Yes. So we can Thank start you. discussion. Yeah. Thanks. I know I heard right. one. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now we can officially talk again about the sorry. Uh, My yes. apologies. That's, I'm willing to support, I mean, I agree with Commissioner Dan that I'm willing to, I, I, I support not supporting the project, <laughs> denial of the application. Um, in light of my concerns, I, I also recognize the need to repair emergencies when they occur, um, which is why I asked about bifurcating, um, just to repair, to just for the, the, I don't want to get this right, the, 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 the pipe, the, in, I want to say inlet, but that's not the right word. Um, can move forward, so that's why I asked about bifurcating. Mm -hmm. But um, but my if, if that's not supported by the commission, I'm my concerns are great enough that I would support the motion as is. Commissioner Gordon, please go ahead. Yeah, I don't support the uh, motion and won't vote for it. I think the, the work is already done. If the superior court uh, accepts the appeal, then the issue of access, which is very important, can be opened again. Um, but right now, that's not an option. Uh, I think denying it is just going to leave it in bureaucratic limbo and cost a lot of money and not really affect the end result. So I would not support this motion. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't, you know, I would prefer a continuance to review the CEQA findings before a denial. Um, However, you know, that's not the vote on the floor right now. And so uh, we do have a motion in a second. So unless there's a, a friendly amendment or an adjustment. Um, Ms. Dan, would you be open to a friendly amendment too? Or just to prove the, the slump slide repair that it was the, so the pipe work can move forward because I, I absolutely share your concerns about the access component. I, I, I share your concerns that the, the fence went beyond the scope of the emergency repair, especially since, to Chair Gordon's point, if we're going to be using the CEQA findings that this is an emergency repair, I, I just can't justify the fence fitting within that scope. Um, and so I don't know if you'd be open to a friendly amendment of, of approving what I consider the emergency work, which is the slope, um, the slump slide repair, but but not including the repair. I don't know if you'd be open open to that. Um, I wish that that's what this application originally recognized. Um, so I guess I would say I'd almost rather um, a substitute motion be made um, instead, and then we can vote on the substitute motion and then the original motion as well. That's fair. That's acceptable. I, I I absolutely think that's appropriate. Um, Commission, uh, sorry if I, I just want to make sure we catch Commissioner Lazenby. She's had her hand in, up here. In furtherance of the discussion, I have a little bit of pause because um, I agree that the court has said that there is no public access and by prescripted by prescription or not, but 
does that apply to all of these houses around this in this uh, cul-de-sac? Because this is only property number 70. They, then there was, I think the attorney Harris mentioned something about uh, property number 60 had an action. Now, if we vote on this motion, will it absolve any further action with respect to violations or whatever as to all the properties? Or will it only be number 70 and then we'll come back with 60 and 90 and 63 or whatever? Commissioner Lazenby, I don't think that this has anything to do with violate, resolving violations. Uh, you're, you're solely uh, considering uh, a CDP and CEQA findings here. Um, whether there are violations from the Coastal Commission is a Coastal Commission matter, and that's being separately adjudicated. Well, I and I agree with that, but as far as there is no responsibility for holding public access, does that apply to all of those houses? And are they all responsible for this emergency uh, repair? Oh, one minute while I look at the at the judgment so that I can answer your okay. question. Ms. Drake, can I ask a question while he looks that up? Yes. Given that Mr. McBeth has not yet been able, at least I don't unless I missed an email, sent us the um, the updated sequel findings. I assume we need those. Well, it's I, an I updated. May need, I, I may need those for my substitute motion. It's well, an updated CEQA well, determination, not the the findings oh. are not being revised, just the the CEQA uh, determination. But we can maybe take a break and send that to everyone because he did prepare it. I think I saw it right, Nate. Commissioner Lazenby, this uh, I'm reviewing the quiet title judgment. It does appear to apply to all the properties along the or at the end of Joffrey Drive, uh, as I read it. Okay, thank you. If um, so, if we made a determination that the um, the emergency repairs should be made into or the emergency permit should be made permanent. I think that's an oversimplification, but would it affect all the properties around there or just number 70? Because this is a gated community and it's only these five houses, I believe. Justin, are you? Uh -huh. Uh, I, um, Commissioner, I'm, I'm trying to understand when you say would it affect what, what is the thrust of your question? Well, this is, this is an action brought by the number 70, the house number 70. Now, that cannot be the only house there that is responsible for paying for or upkeeping or applying to get an, um, a permanent uh, permit for these repairs, for this particular repair. Am I missing the point or is this, a, this is a, a gated community of, I believe it's five houses. There is no other access for the public to get to this community. And if they do not, if they're not responsible for public access, then if we go ahead and we say that the repairs should be made public, uh, permanent or they should be permitted permanently, then will it absolve them from any further actions? Can we say that? Any further actions as far as ensuring public access across their property? Or any complaints about the um, about the way in which the repairs were done and the permit was made, um, the permit was made permanent. I don't understand why this is only this one house that is is spearheading this action. Well, I can tell you that the quiet title judgment, as far as interest in this property, um, it involved. Uh, it appears the owners of the other properties along. 
uh, right. along with Joffrey Drive. And, and that's because this is a drainage, it appears at least as I read this to be a drainage for this driveway, which services these other properties. So access over yeah. that parcel to the public is, is resolved by that quiet title judgment. As far as, as far as whether or not approval of this CDP as it's currently contemplated with the fence has some impact on public access, you know, it, it might conceivably uh, potentially interfere with the future development of prescriptive rights since it would prevent people from trespassing to establish those rights. Right. Um, but I don't know that it would do anything as far as absolving any of the property owners of anything in particular. But if there's a specific concern, I, I, I could maybe give you a better answer. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Violante, I believe you were. Yeah, Chair, I think I would like to offer a substitute motion, if that's all right, um, that we approve application. And, and, and I, I think I'm going to need a break probably before I can fully propose my motion because I don't have Mr. Macbeth's documentation in front of me is the only problem. Um, Just, but I, I'd like to propose an alternative motion that we approve application 201302 but only recognizing the installation of those the slope stability slope site repair without the inclusion of the fence at top uh, at the at, at the top of the hill. But I, Jocelyn, I don't have the new um, thing to include in. I think I think, I think Nate the, just sent it. I, I did I, just send it, but it would not reflect your your current uh, motion in that it has language pertaining to the uh -huh. fence. Okay, and I, and I think basically, I think everything else stays the same, like even some of the concerns that Commissioner Dad, Dan had about um, uh, the coastal development permit, I think because the fence isn't included, I, I, that may help with some of these um, coastal development permit findings, um, I believe that may address some of those. So I'd like to um, offer that motion because it only includes the repair and not um, the, the 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 slide repair and not the fence at the top. Mm -hmm. And to be so. clear, we're saying essentially everything except the fence. Even um, even though the fence was there before, some <clears throat> fence. I, it, it was an unpermitted fence, and so I believe that the emergency component only, since we're using, I, I believe that the the emergency only included the the slide component, and and the fence is not necessary. Okay, just one. I could support your motion, but I have one question for you. Just a common sense one. Don't you think some kind of low fence, even if it's three feet tall, to prevent kids from, like, people from, you know, stumbling or falling is a good idea? I mean, I think that at present that there's an unsettled court case about whether or not there's, I think, well, right now the, I should say, yeah. we're yeah, bound just, by the court right now, but I think that there's an unsettled issue, I should say, about this, and that at present, it just doesn't fit within the scope of the emergency, and therefore I think it's inappropriate if we weigh in to permit something that was not permitted before. And but I mean, within, you didn't answer my question. I, I don't think it's a. I, I am answering your question, which is I don't think it's appropriate that we include it within the scope of this permit. Uh, I, I, is the fence in the court case? I I didn't understand that. No, the the challenge is this. Mr. Shepard, that the fence was, imagine it as never technically being allowed and someone just put it up. Okay. And now we're making a secret determination that this project didn't have an impact based on, and that this new fence that wasn't allowed um, essentially was, is actually, you know, acceptable uh, based on an exemption that had a permit or a fence that wasn't allowed to be there in the first place. Does that make sense? I don't know. I don't think that he really said that even any better. No, no, Tim, I think that was good. And okay. I think that was a that is a fair explanation. And that 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 we're basing the permit on what was an in-kind repair. And there is evidence in the record from some perspectives 
including the California Coastal Commission, that it is not an in-kind repair. So I think that's the basis for Commissioner Violante's motion excluding the fence. Okay, thank you. That is much. Thank you. That's helpful. And now I understand what you're what you're saying, and I would support, I'll support the motion. Then, please. I, because it's an alternative motion, for Commissioner Shepard, I need a second in order. I to will. Uh, I will second it. And then the process goes just to remind folks of parliamentary procedure. When there is a substitute motion made on top of a original motion, the substitute motion must be voted on first, and then the and then the original motion. Commissioner Violante, to clarify that your motion is to uh, support approval of the emergency slope repair and drainage repair, but not the fence, and direct staff to return back at a future meeting with findings. Well, I, well, that's why I was asking Mr. Macbeth if he was able to to send them out, and because I believe most of the findings still hold, and that's why I was asking for clarity if we needed to take a break, um, or if our findings. That's why I was asking about whether oh. we need to take a break for findings, or if we can hold on I any of these findings. That's what I was asking. Do we need to return? That's because I, yeah. I want to be very clear. About I think findings. we can. Yeah, I um, think we, we need to. Thank you. Um, Mr. Graham for asking that clarifying question. That's what I, I was, was trying to get clarity on. Um, since I don't have the documentation, do I need? That's I was going to ask that question too. I think if I may, it makes sense for us to take a break and then have staff review the findings and just um, clarify any of the findings where we might reference the fence and make adjustments mm -hmm. to them. And then you, we can also um, make sure everybody's had an opportunity to review a re-revised CEQA document. Does that it's 1130 anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, everyone wants to use their break during documentation. <laughs> I just want to, do you mind if I just quickly um, make a clarifying, ask a clarifying question? I do think, so we could draft the findings to remove the fence from the scope of the CDP um, and state that it is not uh, approved. I think because there's a driveway directly <clears throat> perpendicular to this slope, I we could return with some kind of barrier, coastal permit barrier um, to a future date. I just don't see not securing that slope in some way with some kind of safety I mean, feature. A curb, they could come back with bollards or something that's appropriate that Mm -hmm. To me, for me, for me, I feel like they could come back with a permit that's not within the scope of this. Mm -hmm. us, us recognizing an emergency. Uh, for me, it's just not an in kind, and just like I said, it's just not appropriate for us to include it in this. Understood. So we can return. Okay. But the, thank yeah. you. I feel like the, I feel like it's appropriate for the applicant mm -hmm. to come up with that, and the applicant to return it, and not within the scope of this. For mm -hmm. for me, obviously, yeah. I make the motion. Okay, I just want to make sure there was support for something, some potential, there was some acknowledgement that we might need to be, come back with some kind of barrier. We'll see. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm willing to support the motion so we can make a ruling. And I, I agree if there's a mechanism, if there's a, any kind of security fence or just keep people from falling, that can be a separate issue. I'm glad to know that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think we need to take a short recess then. And um, what kind of time frame are we looking at here? I might, I'm sorry, I might suggest maybe just going ahead and breaking for lunch. Great. Um, since we're at 1140, we can give our CTV staff a break. Um, well, I, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to leave at 1230. So, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, I thought we'd be done by 1230 and I've. I didn't know this would take this long. So just so you know. Well, okay. we'll half hour? Yeah, let's still take that. The lunch break's half hour, right? Okay. Yeah, let's still make that happen. I think okay. we can probably hopefully get through this. And if we can't, you know, we always have the option to adjust to continue until we have time to to really mm -hmm. finalize. So Okay. So 1210 chair? Please, that sounds great. Thank you so much. Okay, and just to you. just to clarify, um the Two, two versions of the CEQA determination have been forwarded to you, hopefully by now. One includes the fence as a replacement of an existing structure. Another version uh, omits the fence entirely, and it's just for the slide repair. Great. Thank you, sir. 
and Nate and I will take a look at the findings during the break. Okay. Okay. We will see right. you at 1210. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, I can take roll call again. I just wanted to let you know we're just finishing up uh, written um, revised uh, finding and I'm going to send it. Let me send that out really quick and then I can maybe take roll call if that's okay with you, Chair. Sure. Just yep. so you guys have Sounds that. Sounds good. Okay, hold on. Okay. All right, maybe I will start with taking roll call first and then I will uh, get the planning commission up to speed with what we did over lunch. Is that so good? Okay. Please, thank you. Okay. Um, so roll call, uh, Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. And Commissioner Dan. Here. Uh, Commissioner Violante. Here. Um, uh, Commissioner Shepard. Renee? Oh, sorry, I had my microphone off. Yes, I'm here. Okay, and Chair Gordon? Here, thank you. Okay. Um, so where we left it was uh, the Planning Commission directed staff to review the uh, Coastal Development Permit findings and staff report um, to address any references to the proposed fence and to also revise the CEQA determination to address the slump slide repair only. Um, so I just forwarded um, the revised CEQA determination and our understanding of the motion, um, which is to approve the slump slide repair and amend the project description as appropriate to admit the four foot height at the top of the bluff or a four foot high fence at the top of the bluff and to direct the applicant to return at a later date with a revised fence or barrier design if necessary. And um, that would include adopting a revised CEQA determination um, that the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act as an emergency project and to approve application 201302 as revised by staff with revised findings exhibit 1B, which omits any reference to the fence. My computer froze on me there for a second. Um, <laughs> sorry, perfect timing. Um, but I did hear all that. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, so looking at the findings now, is there, can you explain to me that just to be really clear, the statutory exemption versus the categorical and how that relates to the previous CEQA exemption? I just wanted to make sure I really understood that. Um, I see Matt is no longer with us, uh, Matt Johnston, but my understanding from his explanation is that an emergency repair is statutorily exempt under CEQA. And since this is a follow-up CDP to um, um, acknowledge that work that was done, we can rely on that statutory exemption for this coastal permit. Um, however, as pointed out by the uh, Planning Commission, um, it was not appropriate to include the 
fence in the scope of that project. So we're eliminating that from the exemption and that will return with its own CEQA exemption or CEQA determination um, along with the coastal permit should the applicant uh, propose to um, retain some kind of barrier in the future. Great, thank you. That's very clear for me, I appreciate it. Um, so where we're at is on a substitute motion. And so I believe that Ms. Drake read that. Um, Commissioner Violante, did you have any questions or adjustments or are we good to move forward with a vote on this? I was just giving it a quick read over. I apologize yeah, as well. No problem. Take your time. I guess I have a question about the language about the directing the applicant to return at a later date with the revised fence of barrier design if necessary. I mean, we're not giving any sort of a indication by including that language that we will necessarily approve it at a future date or any sort of indication, correct? We're just saying that should they want to pursue that in a future date, they would need to return at a later date, correct? That language that you included? That it would require approval um, through a permit. Okay. Um, and yes, the results of that, um, I mean, I guess it would require them to submit an application, which could or cannot be approved, but the, the point being that it needs to be removed and resolved through a, a follow-up permit, coastal permit. Thank you. Sorry. I that. I just, no, that's fine. I just, <laughs> you're like directing, you're like directing staff to do something, not an applicant. And I sorry. Like yes. Sure, sorry. Sure that's... That we're not giving any sort of, the PC is not indicating our support necessarily of anything, but should they choose to pursue it, that it would in, in require such action on their part. So I just want to be sure. That's a better way to put it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Would it be maybe more appropriate to remove that sentence just generally? We don't need them. We don't need to tell them to return at all. They can if they would like to. They don't have to if they don't want to. Uh, we could. Um, take that out. I just wanted it to be, I mean, we can clarify really for the applicant afterward that that is required of a subsequent permit. I'm fine with it either way, just throwing ideas out there. So now that's, that was good. I guess my con con concern is that if necessary, because we consider it necessary, maybe if, if desired, <laughs> um, would be my only amendment to like my, of that language. We we could just say applicants shall return at a later date with a revised, uh, revised uh, barrier design if desired. <laughs> uh, well, you could just change it to may return. That leaves it open. I I, I don't care. I, re I reject. I don't want to change anything. Let's just move on. Applicant may return at a later date with a revised fence or barrier design if desired. Yeah, I think that's, I just want to be okay. clear that we think it's, I don't want to be clear that we think it is necessary that yes. if, choose, if they choose to return, with, if they want to pursue this, we, we believe it's mm -hmm. necessary. Okay. okay. I, I would support that change as the second or okay. as well. Applicant may return at a later date with revised fence or barrier design if desired. Okay. Can uh, Mr. Machado, can we, uh, can you go ahead? Thank you. I just, I wanted just to uh, ensure there's clarity. So when we say return, I mean, typically a, a fence CDP would, would simply go to the ZA, not to the planning commission. So when you say return, just return to the normal county process, right? We're not, we're not adding extra, extra guidance there, right? Just the standard process, whatever that process is. Is that correct? Fine by me. Okay. Yes, that's thank our intention. You. I just, thank like I said, I don't clarity. want, yeah, that, thank you, Mr. Machado. Like I said, I don't, just don't want to give the impression that we're ordaining some sort of future action. Okay. So can I uh, ask to call the question? I believe we're just ready to vote unless there's further discussion. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, great. Ms. Drake, can we have a roll call vote on this, please? Yes. Um, all right, Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dan. I'm going to be voting no, but 
I very much appreciate Commissioner Violante bringing forward this substitute motion. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Um, Commissioner, uh, Chair Gordon? Yes. And Commissioner Violante? Yes. All right, the motion passes. Thank okay. you for all of your work on this project. Um, do, do we address the uh, primary motion? How does that work? Apologize, my lack of experience on this. Or is it that it? The substitute motion replaces the primary motion because if, if, mine, if mine had failed, then we would have voted on the primary gotta, motion. Got it. Thank That's you. Right. Appreciate it. No problem. <laughs> Great. Okay, so then yes, I apologize for interrupting. That motion passes and we can close this item and move on. Okay. okay and I, as I mentioned, I, I am now um, going to depart. Okay. Thank you. Uh, have a great afternoon, Commissioner Shepard. Okay. Um, okay. Since we are moving on to item number eight and Nathan is the planner for that, we just wanted to just maybe just take a couple of minutes to allow the members of the public to join for that item. Should we have people that were waiting to join? Just and get let Nathan get his head together. Five Maybe or just ten like, minute recess. Is that what um, I think Nathan had asked for a five minute recess. Okay. So I'm good. I'm good to go. Are you okay? Okay. I didn't want to rush you. Okay. Okay. Ready to go. Sorry. Okay, great. great. So okay. if we could load the PowerPoint, uh, Melissa, for the other, thank you. I wanted to say a quick thank you to everyone on the last um, item. That was a lot of detailed and intricate discussion and a lot of advice and input from a lot of people. So just a quick thank you to everyone before we moved on. So, okay, I'm ready. Okay, so we have um, agenda item number eight, project application 211211 at 6201 Soquel Drive. This is a subdivision. And um, Mr. Macbeth, take it away. Thank you. The subject property is approximately 36,478 square feet in size and developed with an existing nine unit dwelling group consisting of four individual buildings. The uh, property was historically used as a travel motel between approximately 1939 and 1950. Uh, historic resource report was prepared and submitted to the county for review. Uh, the report provides an extensive history of the property and structures on site. It was concluded uh, that the site uh, and existing structures were of no historical significance. Uh, the site is currently, un currently occupied by long-term tenants. Uh, which has been the case since uh, that visitor accommodation use ceased. Uh, next slide, please. It's the location of the project on Soquel Drive, uh, just north uh, on the north side, uh, just west of Cabrillo College. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, Zoning for the site is RM3. Next slide. Which is consistent with the urban high residential density. Next slide. This is the location of the property uh, off of, as seen from Soquel Drive. Um, there's a, um, the primary structure on site is a Victorian style home that you can see kind of the peak of uh, just above that car there. As we turn on to Merrill Drive, or Merrill Road rather, uh, you start to see, this is side view of that home. And, um, and the sidewalk kind of just disappears there uh, as we turn the corner. Next slide. As you can see, a bunch of dense vegetation throughout the site, kind of as we travel up Merrill Drive, here's the primary driveway to the site in that lower frame and uh, the second building on the site is kind of center of the frame. Next slide. These are the site photographs of all the structures. You can see the uh, primary dwelling 
uh, is uh, consists of two individual dwelling units within building one. Building two down below is a single unit, kind of a carriage house. Next slide, please. The back portion of the parcel consists of two primary structures that are really long in, in um, as you can see in the far right frame here under building three, it's kind of a motel style uh, development. Between the two buildings, each, each of these buildings contains three residential units. Next slide, please. This is a site plan of the subject parcel. The largest, larger dwelling, um, the Venetian, or the Venetian, the um, Victorian is up front there. Um, and you can see Merrill where we came in, that driveway. Next slide, please. This is the proposed uh, boundary of parcel one and two. Kind of just cuts right down the middle. Next slide. Parcel one will have um, approximately 15,500 square feet, three dwellings, two in the main home and one in that carriage home. The back parcel of 20,000 square feet will contain uh, six dwelling units. Next slide, please. The project proposes a, a new driveway with parking, uh, a right-of-way dedication along Merrill that wraps, um, actually, could you click forward through here, through this slide? There we go. Uh, here's the um, proposed driveway parking. This, uh, this uh, new roadway, if you will, driveway access requires a roadside roadway roadside exception because it's less than the standard 56 feet which would be required for uh, an access that's serving this many units um, public works has reviewed it and determined that based on the traffic level here um, and the other site improvements that are proposed the width is appropriate as part of this project there's some right-of-way dedication as i mentioned can you click again please uh, this is this graphically displays the right-of-way dedication. This would be um, offered to the county uh, and improved with a sidewalk that wraps all the way down around to Soquel Drive. The end here on Soquel Drive, that's where a new bus stop uh, kind of platform will be serving an existing bus stop. It's expanded to include to, to be able to accommodate a, a new um, cover enclosure. And again, widening the sidewalk. And then uh, finally, the last improvement along Soquel Drive would be the abandonment of an existing driveway just up Soquel Drive. If you can click one more time, we'll show it, folks where that's at. There we go. But it would be abandonment of that new curb gutter. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the site will also include a, um, there's a number of trees that are gonna be removed. Uh, be augmented by a uh, revised landscape plan. All the necessary parking will be provided on site. And um, maybe I didn't mention, but there's no residential units being proposed as part of this project. Uh, the, um, the project will is, is designed to retain all of the existing uh, rental housing that exists on site. Uh, staff have uh, received a number of inquiries regarding um, from members of the public, uh, all just wanting more information about the project. Um, uh, all comment, if there, there is no comment, has been formally submitted. Uh, the applicant held uh, a neighborhood meeting uh, as required by code. Uh, only one neighbor was in attendance at that meeting. And um, I believe that all of the issues that were raised by that neighbor have been, um, are gonna be addressed by the applicant. That was namely um, the continuation of a shared fence line that might possibly be um, uh, uh, interrupted by the proposed development. As proposed in condition, the project is consistent with all applicable codes and policies, the zoning ordinance and general plan, therefore staff recommends a determination that the proposal uh, be found exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act and approval of application 211-211 based on the attached findings and conditions. 
Um, that concludes my presentation. Um, available for any questions. Great, thank you, Mr. McBeth. Appreciate that. Uh, would any commissioners like to ask? Sorry, I'm hearing Zoom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if you can clarify for me what what the project actually entails. Because I looked at the map and I have my interpretation of which I mean the the project yeah. documents, um, and I find interpretation. But if you could clarify, that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, there are there are two areas that are designated for um, pedestrian access serving both parcel a or parcel one and parcel b um, the portion of the portion that's on parcel two is um, is incorporated into the required roadway width so it'll be kind of a shared sort of space right so it's a way to achieve the 24 foot for two-way traffic. So that is the piece that's on the north side. There is a um, an access on the south side, but it's not immediately adjacent to the roadway. It kind of goes between those units, if I recall correctly. Um, and yeah, the, the material is, is going to be one that's durable and dustless. Um, so yeah, the, 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 um, if I'm looking at sheet A1 or A A0, um, you can see the pedestrian access as noted, uh, kind of just outside of the driveway. And it says access to buildings three and four. And then um, and then the other walkway is proposed on the other side of unit uh, two from kind of the edge of the parking to the south side of that building, reaching out to the to the new sidewalk on Merrill. That was my interpretation. So that's yeah. good to know I'm reading the map, the, yeah. the documents correctly. I do believe, though, that the um, as a result, the roadway and roadside exception findings need to be amended because when you read it, it describes it as four foot wide at grade pedestrian walkway aisles constructed of stamped concrete along are proposed along both sides of the interior roadway. Um, I I suppose you could sure. interpret the one on the, I think we're gonna call it south side, the one on parcel two um, could be interpreted as both sides of the interior driveway, but I think that, that it's only the one on parcel one that would be considered along the interior driveway. Um, that's, that's correct. I think that that's reflected in on page nine. Is that right? What, yeah, so page nine is page correct. Nine says, Page nine says both sides. So would oh, we consider that? Yeah. So would we consider that both sides in, in the, ex, the the findings? Because I believe we would only say one side. And that that's just like I said, it was just inconsistent in the staff report. It says one one side, and then in the findings it says both. And so I was just I want to ensure that our findings correctly reflect the situation, which is why I'm asking. I apologize for being so specific in my questions. But no, I, I appreciate it. You're I you're correct. It should only be findings. one side. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's what the staff report said was um, that the findings, which is probably the most important spot that it get it right, um, said both. Okay. So I think we might need to amend that before we get to motions. Okay, thank you. Um, Great, any other questions? No? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Nate, for that presentation. Really, really appreciate it. Um, you can always, as always, make it very clear for us. Um, uh, at this time, we can ask the applicant if they have uh, anything to add or presentation at this time and move on to public comment. Okay. I see Ken Hart has his hand raised. Uh, so we'll start with Ken. Good morning, or I guess good afternoon at this point. Will you please restate your name for the record? Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, good great. Afternoon. Thank you for the presentation, Nate. I think the staff reports uh, is a good, good staff report and very concisely um, characterizes the, the proposed project. Um, one thing that I would like to add, and I don't know if, Nate, you can put that um, one of the site plans back up on the screen. Is that is that possible so that the commission can see what I'm referring to? 
-hmm. So back to the PowerPoint. Nate, I just, so I want to call attention to the, um, the relocation or the reorientation of the fence line at the, along the eastern property line. There was a concern uh, by the, I believe she's the president of the HOA of the condominium complex to the east, um, that if that fence line was to be um, realigned, it could leave a small gap uh, in uh, in the in their fence and would because they've been having some problems with um, unauthorized access onto their property. And our intention is to to not leave that gap is to close to close any gap that is um, results from the reorientation of that uh, realignment of the fence line. We'd be certainly happy to have a condition of approval um, added that um, to that effect if if that's satisfactory. That's really the only comment I had. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hart. Appreciate that. Did any commissioners have questions of the applicant before we open the rest of the public comment? Okay, hearing none, let's go ahead and open public comment at this time. Ms. Drake? All right. I see a hand raised by Karen. Um, good afternoon, Karen. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. And you want to press star six, as I recall, to unmute if you're calling in. There you go. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Yeah, Afternoon. Here for yourself. yeah, I'm this is Fernando. I'm the husband of Karen. It's a long time. Uh, I had a question about uh, emergency services and the the access. It's very difficult to talk about these things when you take the maps down. Um, for the future, you might want to do something with that. But uh, we had a problem. I live on uh, McGlenn, and I was just curious about a fire truck. And if you had an emergency, even if fire trucks uh, come with the um, EMTs, and would that fire truck be able to make that turn there on that access road that you're including to the... Um, the apartment, the units. Um, Fernando, go ahead and uh, state all of your comments and we'll address any questions at the end of public comment. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, that's a very narrow road. Um, a lot of kids play there. Um, Merrill, I'm speaking of. Um, there's a rather large project right across the street from that. And I'm I'm concerned about traffic uh, and, parking. and parking, but I think you addressed that when you had the map up. It's difficult to, again, it's difficult to speak about these things without having a visual in front of you. Uh, that's about it. Otherwise, um, I know we need housing. Oh, oh, affordability. If you could be a little clearer, you may have gone over this already, uh, about affordability on these um, uh, projects. And I thought I heard somebody say that they will be occupied by people who are occupying that uh, parcel uh, at the present time. That's correct. I'd like some clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you. Time to spare. Mm -hmm. All right. And I'm seeing a hand raised by uh, Victoria. Um, Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record. Hi, Victoria Smith Raymond. And um, I was the uh, only uh, neighbor that had attended the, the uh, community meeting. Um, I apologize, I have laryngitis, but um, I wanted to say that um, Ken Hart has been very accessible and um, did um, address already the um, issue of the fencing. And um, because we had just put a perpendicular fence uh, parallel to Soquel um, on the property to um, help with um, the reduction of 
um, people coming onto the property and using it for uh, various reasons. And <clears throat> my only other question was looking at the map. Um, I had asked about um, grading and um, Nathan had, had um, mentioned that there wouldn't be any other grading uh, because we have a problem with um, drainage coming from that property right onto um, our cul-de-sac and right in front of my home. Um, and it, it, but it appears that the parking spaces are going to be just on the other side of the fence from, um, from there. So I don't understand how uh, the parking spaces can be in there, um, can be put there without any additional grading, um, if that could be clarified. I think that's the, the only thing that I have. And um, we did uh, just elect a, a new board. So um, the conversations will need to be with them as far as the like the fence um, and how to make sure that there isn't any gap there. And when they rectify the three foot, um, um, there, there was a, a three foot um, mistake, I guess, when the original fencing was put in over 35 years ago. So um, anyway, uh, that's the only comment that I have. To clarify that <clears throat> parking. Thank you, Victoria. All right. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak at this time about this uh, proposed application? And I am not seeing any, so I will turn it back over to you, Chair. Okay, great. Thank you. Then we can go ahead and close our. Actually, let's bring it back to Ken. If Ken had anything more to add, you have a few more minutes to respond if desired. Uh, oh, and his hand is raised. Great. Ken? There you go. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, just, uh, I just wanted to address um, Victoria's point about parking um, being located right on the other side of the fence. I believe um, that she's referring to the existing parking spaces that are along the eastern property line of the subject property, the western property line of her, her property. Th those are all existing spaces and there won't be any changes there. Um, any The grading that's going to take place, the, the lion's share of it actually will be out at the corner of Merrill and Soquel, where that hillside will be shaved back um, in order to provide sight distance, better sight distance for cars coming out of Merrill onto Soquel Drive. But I think that that, um, I, if, I, if I understood correctly, the parking spaces that she was referring to are all existing. There'd be no change. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Appreciate that. Um, then at this time, we can go ahead and close the public comment and bring the uh, matter back to the commission for discussion. Did any commissioners have anything to discuss uh, on this topic? Chair Gordon, if I may, um, I actually have a question for Mr. Macbeth, but I it was actually brought up by the public, but I more specifically, but I, I had a question for him. Throughout this, the staff report um, and some of the, the findings, it, it routinely talks about the exception for the width of the road, talking about um, the low level of traffic the interior road sees at present, but that's based on the current number of units on the site. And I was just wondering if he could ask answer a few questions about um, whether or not in the future should this parcel be developed, whether or not that would meet, whether or not there'd be a possibility in the future of, of expanding the width of this road, um, internal road, um, if that would happen, because we know that there's the possibility of an increased density should this parcel be developed in the future and would an increase of the roadway be possible or required at that time if Mr. Regbeth could answer that question. Yeah, I think so. Um, um, yeah, the, I think th there's a, a lot of parts to your question. Um, the, the current proposal is uh, consistent with the allowed density for the RM3 site. So in terms of um, you know, future development, um, what that would look like would be something in excess of the current general plan designation. 
any future uh, division of this parcel would you know be subject to review and approval right so if we had more units proposed and uh, you know a condo style development of that kind um, we would have to then look at the adequacy of the roadway width and how it would serve the interior of that parcel so kind of a revisiting of the site um, yeah this is one uh, project that's been designed specifically to retain the existing housing stock on site um, and so and so really that's that's what I would say about the adequacy of the road um, it's to serve this site um, and the number of units that are currently on Thank you, I appreciate that. Welcome. Okay, any other questions or comments? Doesn't sound like it. Great. Um, I have a question. Sure, Commissioner Lazen. Uh, the access road. The access road is shared by the two parcels. Is that correct that's correct okay so if you in the future sold off one of the parcels let's say the back part lot number two what would happen to the access road nothing So is it creating an easement on each one of the parcels then? Yeah, I think um, to, the easement is actually, yeah, it's the, the entirety of the um, access is located on parcel two with a, will be a deeded access to parcel one. Um, yeah, if the parcel was to be sold, uh, there are, will be covenants in place to secure the, right of access to you know both parcels that was for access and parking right yeah it's really because the parking is actually outside of the the easement or the right of Got way it. um yeah. it but yeah it's immediately adjacent to um, the parking for um parcel one Got it. okay did that answer your question, Commissioner Lazenby? Take that as a silence as a, <laughs> is a yes. Um, then, <clears throat> you know, if any commissioner would see it appropriate, it might be a good time for a motion or. Mr. McBeth, before I make my motion, I just want to verify that. This project is located in Simcoe Creek Water District. That's correct, it is. Okay. I'm gonna make a motion that includes amending some uh, conditions because uh, again, on page 16 of the agenda packet, um, uh, condition three F, it reads city of Santa Cruz Water District and I'm gonna amend that before I do. I just wanna verify that I'm correct in doing so. Um, you are good catch. <laughs> There's also just a small typo um, uh, on uh, 5A where it says count road, and I'm going to amend that to say county road, and I want to make sure I'm not um, not doing anything untoward by amending a couple of things here. Um, I'm also going to touch that um, the north county condition, the pardon me, the north uh, the north side concrete, the interior road as well. So, uh, correct. And and sorry, okay. what was what what page was the count wrote on? Uh, I'll I'll touch them in my motion. Okay. But page seventeen. Got it. Um. So I'd make a motion that we um. Up, let me make sure I get all of the things included that we have to do. That we um approve application two one one two one one. Um, based on the the findings in the staff report with um, a few amendments um, and they include amending on page nine of the staff report um, amending the roadway and roadside exception findings uh, to read that uh, the four foot wide at grade pedestrian walk aisles constructed of stamped concrete are along the north side of the interior roadway 
um, including that on page 16 of the conditions of approval, 3F should read Soquel Creek Water District. And on page 17, there's a typo should be corrected of 5A and where feasible all improvements adjacent to or affecting a county road um, uh, should be uh, uh, corrected. And then determine that the proposal is exempt from further environmental review under the California um, Environmental Quality Act. So that would be my motion. I'll second it. Great, thank you very much, Commissioner Violante and Commissioner Dan. Um, any further discussion on this before we move to a vote? Okay, great. Ms. Drake, can we please do a roll call vote on this? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. Okay, Chair Gordon. Yes. Commissioner Dan. Yes. And Commissioner Violante. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Um, thank you so much. Okay, with that, we can close out agenda item number eight and move right along. Thank you everyone for the input and help and, and the presentation on, on uh, item eight there. Um, moving on to agenda number uh, nine, planning director's report, Mr. Machado, how are you today? Uh, thank you, chair. And thank you, commissioners. Uh, no report today. Uh, just thank you for your continued uh, Hard work. I see the work that you put into this, just like you've done on past items. So thank you for all that extra good effort. Absolutely. Um, great. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. So we can move on to agenda item number 10, upcoming meeting dates. Ms. Drake, what we've got? So I think we've already sent out a cancellation notice. If not, you'll be receiving one soon. The December 28th planning commission meeting is canceled. Um, we do have one item so far um, scheduled for the January 11th Planning Commission mm -hmm. meeting, so be prepared to convene after the, the new year. We are also anticipating a meeting on January 25th as well, um, so we're going to hit the ground running in January with a couple of meetings. Um, I am working with our ISD department to bring the meetings back to the chambers with a call-in feature for the public as we've discussed in the past. Depending on what we have on the agendas and where we're at with testing that um, new meeting format and possibly also um, looking at uh, commissioner appointments and where those might fall, I'm I'm a little bit unclear about when we're going to come back to the chambers. I'm I'm just trying to put a couple of pieces together. So it is likely that we'll continue the remote format for the first meeting for sure, possibly the second meeting, depending on those factors I mentioned, um, with um, with a with the intent to come back to the chambers in February. But I will definitely keep everybody posted. Um, and that is all I have. Chair, may I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, um, Ms. Drake, could you send the 2023 dates? If I received them, I <clears throat> must have missed them. Yes. Or deleted them. <laughs> but but hey. it turns out I will need them. So. I would love to send those to you. Well, thank um, you very much. <laughs> yes, I will send those to everybody. Um, yep, and I will Great. keep everyone posted. Okay. Oh, I wanted to, I'm sorry. I have one other thing really quick. It's not okay. about meeting dates. I wanted to introduce Nicholas Brown. Um, he, Nick, there he is. Um, Nicholas has been with us for a couple of months now. Um, however, we haven't had an opportunity to introduce him to the Planning Commission formally, I don't think. Um, he is Mike Lamb's replacement. Um, so you'll be seeing a lot of Nick. Um, he'll be uh, corresponding with Nicholas, just like you did with Mike on any follow-up questions about packets or meeting dates or anything else. He's... Um, He's fantastic, and we're really excited to have him on our team. So um, welcome, Nicholas, and um, yeah, there yeah. he is. Good to meet you. Good to put a face to the name. 
Welcome, Nicholas. And uh, and um, I apologize to Michael. I have been emailing Michael. <laughs> um, and congratulations to Michael. And uh, thank you, Nicholas, for all your work in putting our packets together. You're welcome. I'm really happy to be here. Appreciate all y'all. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, do we have a county council's report today? Nothing to report, thank you. Okay. Well, we made it through 2022. That's it. <laughs> that, was a, that was a tough year. A lot of big stuff this year. So it's it's 2023 is going to be smooth sailing, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just the housing element. <laughs> oh. I've been waiting for smooth sailing since 2020, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone. Yeah. I'm sad that we weren't in person, so we weren't able to do some cookies, coffee, some kind of celebration. Uh, we'll postpone yeah. it until the new year. Extra right. cookies in the new year. Okay. Yeah, totally. All right. Nice to okay. see everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. All right. See ya. Thank you.